I built the first instructional videos in the world on how to integrate weightlifting and Swiss balls, how to use them in a the gym. And I built the first videos in the world on how to use a Swiss ball for athletic rehabilitation and probably pioneered the whole concept. So and I did a lot of my research on the Swiss ball in 88 and had developed my routines and techniques by 89 when I started developing the first videos. Mm. Um, and the first professional sports team to hire me to teach them my system of core conditioning and how to use Swiss balls was the Chicago Bulls. And I did seven consultations with the Bulls. Al Vermeil, I don't know if you know Al Vermeil, but he's a famous strength. He's got more uh, championship rings than any strength coach in the world, 13 of them, between football and basketball. And uh, he had an open door policy. His policy was anytime you got something cool to teach us, well, I'll it, come on down. So I was during the Jordan era. And uh, then the Lakers saw how they were training and doing all this stuff. So the Lakers bought the stuff. And prior to that, the, uh, um, and they're not there anymore, Raiders. They, the Raiders bought all my correspondence courses because one of their strength coaches had studied some of my material. And I actually still have the check because they were the first professional football team to get into my stuff. And this is like, you know, 89, 90, long time ago. Mm -hmm. A company in New Zealand, Fitness Works, who makes exercise equipment, hired me as a consultant and just had me look at all their equipment and said, if you were to do whatever you wanted, what would you do? And I said, and this is back in the days when the old bodybuilding style, this is before they even had adjustable things, and that was one of the things I encouraged them to do too, is mm. make the table adjustable so you can use different angles. Right. And there was nothing like that out there anywhere in the world then. Mm. So I introduced them to the concept of changing the angle, because if you change the angle, you functionally change the exercise. If you change the angle more than 15 degrees, it causes a shift in the nervous system, which requires that you develop a new motor program. And I said to them, look, you can't do a lot of exercises that are functional when you have only one on each end. So if you put these things side by side, there's all sorts of pushing and pulling exercises you can do. So this is the first version, which we called the triple cross. I had this one custom built because I worked with a lot of professional basketball and volleyball players. Actually, Often I'll erase the board. And what I do is on my rest periods, I just let my soul express itself and that helps integrate the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So it actually deepens the quality of your rest because you're shifting from left brain to right brain or sympathetic to parasympathetic. I also developed the whole concept of working in. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's the concept I developed. So it mixed Tai Chi and Qigong exercises. So I'd have athletes and myself doing them on the rest periods to deepen the response so the body heals faster and you gain more energy so you actually can perform better, especially for these guys like kettlebell lifters where they have to put out so much and their workouts are so intense, it allows them to do longer, harder workouts. So I paint quite often or draw whatever in here, I draw uh, between sets and I just do a little something and then when it's time to exercise, whether it be a minute or whatever, however heavy I'm lifting, I just do whatever I can do and then go back at it because it's relaxing. So there's a concept that I've pioneered. I actually had a pro baseball pitcher come to me one time uh, from, I believe it was the White Sox. It's been a long time. It's like, you know, 1990 type stuff. And uh, six days after he had surgery on his shoulder, it's a funny story because I worked with this surgeon who was very skilled and good named Charles Rowland. And he recruited this surgeon from the team, it was the, it was the White Sox or one of those East Coast teams, to come work in his organization. And because the player knew this doctor, he wanted that doctor to do the surgery. So the guy flew to San Diego for a surgery and was staying here. But Chuck Rowland, who was a friend of mine, who I rehabbed from a very bad back injury, and his wife's a very skilled physio, but she couldn't figure out what to do with him. So Charles, who had been referring me patients for years, I rehabbed him so he, he knew that I could do these kinds of things so he sent this player to me. And so the first time the player came to me after I did my assessment I gave him an hour workout on the total gym because he was already very nervous about how quick he would rehab so I said I'll keep getting in shape don't worry. 
So when he went back to the doctor for a checkup, for the first checkup after the surgery, the doctor said, well, how's it going in therapy? And he says, oh, it's amazing. He says, the guy worked me out for an hour. I feel great. And the orthopedic surgeon just fucking freaked out because he, he could have no concept in his head of how could someone work out after a surgery like that. And before the athlete could even tell him anything, he picked up the phone. He said, what's that guy's number? Called me up and he chewed me out so fucking loud I had the foot phone a foot and a half of my head. And all the patients in the therapy clinic could hear every word he was saying, he was yelling at me. So I let the guy yell and yell and yell and finally the phone went quiet. And I said, Doc, ask, I forgot the guy's name, it's been too long. I said, ask him how he's doing. And he already knew the guy was doing this. He just told him. He said, well, he's doing great. I said, why are you so upset then? He goes, do you realize how dangerous started the whole thing again? I said, why do you think Charles Rowland referred him to me? And so finally I said, look, I know exactly what I'm doing. Why don't you come down to my clinic and I'll show you what I'm doing. So this is back in the years before unweighted exercise was even very well known. It was known in Scandinavia. So I built my own unweighting systems, which look like engine hoists. And I use fishing scales and I got a special harness that looks like a parachute harness and I could put people on my system and I even have a special harness I built for the neck so if they had cervical injuries I could unweight the head and I could have them do things like upper ergometer, body ergometers, dumbbell training, cable, putting stretch cords without any pressure on their injured spine or disc at all and I could do the same for the lumbar spine. So when he came and I showed him my unweighting systems and the total gym and how I did it, it blew his fucking mind. He really was freaked out. He's like, oh my God, he said, Paul, I work for one of the most prestigious organizations in the world and what you're doing here is so far ahead of anything I've ever seen. It's outrageous. And then when he realized I don't even have a college, I don't even have a high school diploma, that freaked him out even more, which often freaks people out on professional sports teams. They're like, how the fuck can this guy know this much? So we just gotta pay attention. You know, I grew up on a farm lifting a lot of rocks because our plows would always hit. We had a lot of rocks in the soil. And I used to hate lifting rocks. But an interesting thing, this is how, how life works, how the soul works. I love Rumi's poetry and I studied Rumi's poetry for years. And there's a famous translator of Rumi's poetry called Coleman Barks. Are any familiar with Coleman Barks? Mm -hmm. Well, Rumi's poetry is very, very deep and profound. I'm familiar with Rumi. Yeah. Coleman Barks. Yeah. So I got a hold of Coleman Barks, and I happened to be talking to him, and I said, I was just talking to him, and I was looking for a mentor, someone who could be like a spiritual teacher to me, to take me into a deeper understanding of Rumi's poetry and, and any spiritual practices I could use to grow myself. And he just happened to say, well, what do you do for exercise? He didn't know who I was, you know, and I said, well, I do a lot of exercise. He said, well, I lift stones. He said, that's all I do is lift stones. And it just, a lightning bolt went through me. I said, fuck, I gotta start lifting stones again. I used to hate it as a kid, but I had to lift stones all day long for hours and hours and hours. And it was just boring, pouring fucking rain, picking the stones up and carrying them to the edge of the field. It was not fun. But something inside of me felt it was time to go back to the stones. So I started lifting stones again and I was blown away at how wildly athletic it was and how far more challenging it is than anything you can do in the gym. And I used to, you know, I still do, but I used to build, I've, I've built stacks at home 16 feet tall, like as tall as our orange trees. I have to stand on the very tops of 10 foot ladders to finish them off. And it's, it's dangerous, you can get killed. You know, those stones are heavy. And now when those things hit the ground, they'll bounce sometimes three feet in the air. And I've had fingers smashed, toes smashed. I've been cut right open. I've flown backwards, landed in the rocks, almost concussed myself before. So it, you know, it takes you, you have, you have to go into a very Zen state to do this kind of stone sculptures or you'll get hurt. And I teach classes on it. But there's scorpions out here, there's black widows out here, there's all sorts of little things that'll bite you. You can, you know, the, the rocks, they're, they don't have a the center of gravity is not where the center of the stone is by shape. 
So you can pick up something that looks square, but the center of gravity can be way off to one side. So one hand's getting worked twice as hard as the other hand. The edges can be very sharp. I've stepped on things that you couldn't see. I've had uh, arrowheads go right through my foot before. And when you're carrying a big fucking stone and you step on something sharp like that, you, you can't just drop it. It'd cut your feet off. You know, you'd crush your feet. So you have to breathe and slow down and, and really center yourself. But every athlete I've ever taught to use stones, it blows them away. You spend two or three workouts out here lifting stones and go back to what you were doing in the gym, the same weights that used to seem heavy to you seem like they just come up like butter. It integrates your nervous system so well and it's, it requires so much more athletic ability and balance and coordination that a gym feels like uh, kindergarten. Gym's kind of fake after a while. Yeah. Picking it, rocks up. Yeah. These are the original books on the abdominal brain, for example. That's the 1899 edition of the abdominal and pelvic brain. That's the 1907 edition by Byron Robinson, MD. The guy that did the most pioneering research. Most people haven't even heard of this guy. I remember one time I had a, a quite well-known doctor who was a PhD, MD, and a DC. He was doing some work with me on a project. And he brought me what was then just published, a book called The Abdominal Brain which was you know, maybe 12 years ago, 15, maybe 15 years ago when it first came out. He was all excited about it and he was showing it to me and I said, that's old news. He goes, what do you mean this old? This is brand new research, this just came out. So I walked him into my library and had him this, he almost shit himself. <laughs> so if you lose awareness and practice of what is happy making, how do I use exercise intelligently, how do I eat intelligently, and how do I rest intelligently, Every one of those spokes that's disabled creates tremendous amount of resistance in your life and the pain teacher comes to kick your ass until you finally find a doctor or a therapist that educates you on what you need to know. Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson, Andrews Varner, and uh, we drove into the desert all the way to Escondido mm -hmm. and to visit uh, Mr. Paul Check. And we are we thought we were entering his home, but we're actually entering his his office. office. Yeah. And uh, came up. There's you know you, you saw the the uh, the tour and the gym and and I am really excited about this uh, primarily because I, I've heard your name since I mean since I started studying health and fitness uh -huh. and I got on a plane about three years ago and I ran into a couple of your students oh is that right and there's uh, a few of them out there and uh, we ended up having a, a layover and we were going to the same competition and we got sitting down and talking and then they uh, uh, they asked me if I knew who you were and I was like well I, I know of him and when they started sharing with me all the things like the depth and uh, uh, that you go with uh, your teachings, I, at that point, said to myself, I want to meet Paul at some point. Well, so good. this is thank you. This is a real pleasure. Thank um, you. And I, I'm most excited about hearing about how you think about. Like, it sounds like you think about everything from a, a big whole systems uh, perspective, and yeah. consider more than uh, what most people are considering when they think about their health. So that that's what I'd really like to learn today. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much a systems man. Yeah. Uh, because in both life and in the human body, there's no system that operates independent of any other system. So if you think of the body like a spider's web, you cannot touch any part of a spider's web without affecting the whole thing. So if you look at the way people do research and try to isolate hormones or do research on elbow flexion or these kinds of things... This is creates the illusion of knowledge, and it's dangerous knowledge because it leads people to actually believe in things without understanding how it's affecting other systems. So in my life and in my work, I've spent a lot of time learning how each system influences every other system 
because oftentimes the symptoms are really not the problem. They're the symptoms of a system that's stressed from excessively compensating for other systems. Yeah. So on that note, what, what are your thoughts about the scientific method in general about isolating a single variable to, to do a research study? Is there value there, or, or mm-hmm. how, how do you do research if you can't isolate a variable? Well, you, you, there is value, value there, but you have to be um, conscious of what it is that you're looking at. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, I can give you a 24-hour cortisol rhythm test with just taking your saliva, and let's say the test come back and it shows me that your cortisol DHEA ratio is all screwed up and indicates you have phase three adrenal exhaustion. And then I can give you licorice root, DHEA, and a number of other supplements to bring cortisol levels up. Mm. And that sounds really good and that would be very scientific, wouldn't it? Yeah, if you're only worried about those two things. The question is though, yeah. how the hell did your adrenal glands get burnt out in the first place? Mm. So then when I look into your life and find out you're going through a divorce, and that you're now having to uh, pay two places, pay rent for yourself and pay for your wife and alimony for your kids. So you're now having to work overtime every day and you're training for some athletic event. Well, there's not enough licorice root in the world to address those (laughs) issues. So, you know, you could swim in this stuff. So this is what happens. And this is why a lot of elite athletes come to me because they've seen all the scientists and doctors in the world, but they keep looking at, the symptoms of problems that you, you know, how do you research love? Mm-hmm. How do you scientifically validate the health of a person's relationship with their spouse? How do you really effectively research what foods work for them on any given day? Because you change so rapidly with weather, with exercise stress, with toxicity, the list of things that will change your internal genetic workings through epigenetics and change what you need at a dietary level are so long that we get people reading books like the China study and then they start eating like they're a Chinaman, but they're not. And they're not looking at the fact that we each have genes. And if your parents, for example, are from England or Scandinavia or any place in the world where the ground freezes in the winter, well, plants don't grow out of ice, so we had to live off of meat. So if you've got genes that are wired to use flesh foods to get nutrients from and to rebuild cells, and all of a sudden you're reading a, a vegan diet book or an Ornish book, Well, you think you're doing the right thing based on science, but you can end up very sick and very dysfunctional. And I've had many Mm. vegans and vegetarian athletes in here very screwed up, but they'll sit here and argue with me till they're blue in the face about how good their philosophy is. And I have to remind them, well, if it's so good, why are you here sick and broken? So what in your mind are the most common root causes for people that come to you that are sick and broken? A lack of understanding of the principles that life works on. Period. Yeah just not understanding how life works, not understanding how stress summates from all areas of their life. So if a person's got financial stress, if they've got relationship stress, if they've got performance anxiety, if they've got musculoskeletal problems, if they've got bacterial dysbiosis, parasite infections, fungal infections. I mean, most people that that I see, even people that think they're healthy, blow the charts right off when I start doing assessments on them and start using functional medicine to look at their hormonal systems. They, they look like total wrecks, but a lot of them look good in the mirror. I, I'm the guy that coined the term the fit sick person because we now have an era of people that look good in the mirror but are very, very sick on the inside. Mm. Yeah, do you think this necessity to have a, a more of an understanding uh, is, is coming and it's 2018 now because we, we've got a, uh, pretty much an artificial environment we've built around ourselves. Is this an understanding that wasn't necessary, you know, 100 years ago or 500 years ago that we now need to have because yes. there's so much going on? Yes, we do need it because we're so disconnected from the earth. And we're also, we've just moved through the age of information, though it's very alive. Uh, the experts on, on the ages and you know like social ages that we're going through say we're now moving into the age of context we've just come out of the information age that doesn't mean information's not growing very fast all you got to do is track the speed that computers process and now we're you know entering the realm of quantum computation which right. is going to take us to a, a very wild and crazy experience that mm-hmm. most people have no idea what's about to happen but it's it's 
going to be very positive, but also very scary at the same time because we're about to unleash a dragon. With it's going to get weird. It's going to get weird. You know, yeah. um, we don't we don't have to go down that path because that's a whole other topic. But you know, most people live so much in their head and spend so much time looking at television screens, video screens, phone screens. And we've developed an entire academic culture that prides itself on the ability to state facts, figures, and memorization. But people don't realize that knowledge is just a collection of ideas. Wisdom is the synthesis of the practice of those ideas. And it's only wisdom when you are sure it works. So we now have all sorts of people worldwide, the majority of our population, that actually thinks that they're doing the right thing and like the vegans I was talking about, and I don't have anything against veganism, if it's working for you, great. Like people using various supplements that they read, and this is going to do this, or this will lower your cortisol, this will raise your cortisol. We have people that believe what is stated by anybody that has some kind of advanced fancy degree or wears a white jacket, like it's the word of God. But what's happening is they're spending so much time trading information and using information that actually is disconnecting them from the most essential principles that I call the four doctors, such as what am I doing all this for? What is my dream? What am I working to create in my life? What gives me a sense of meaning? Dr. Diet, how should I eat for my individual needs, which you can't do until you develop an intimate relationship with your body. So most people just read books and research articles and pay no attention to how they're feeling. And I watch people get fat, I watch them get skinny, I watch them get pimples, I watch them get exhausted, I watch them burn their adrenal glands out, all while they're doing this diet that's scientifically validated without realizing that that diet is only valid on a, in, in a computer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think a, In a piece of paper. <laughs> I think people look at athletes and people that may have great looking physiques. And, and uh, if you would ask me 10 years ago, hey, uh, are you in touch with your body? I'd have been like, oh, yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. And then having lived a little bit longer and, and having a, actually creating a relationship with my body, I go, wow, I actually didn't know. Right. How do you, how do you, teach somebody to build that relationship with their body and who, who are the people that you interact with that they come to you and they go, oh, I do. Ha-, they may think they have a relationship with their body. What do you tell them to help them see that differently? Well, first of all, I do very comprehensive testing and I test uh, 29 different systems in the body, which I graph out for them. And like I was saying, I have vegans and vegetarians telling me how great their diet is, but I put their test results in front of them. And they look like they're ready to die any minute. And so you know, the simple thing that I do, but before I tell you that, I got to finish what I was saying earlier. We talked about Dr. Happiness. What's my dream? What am I doing this for? We talked about Dr. Diet. Then we have to be aware of Dr. Movement. And there's two classes of movement. I coined the term working in, which means doing any activity at a low enough intensity and timed with breathing to harmonize your biological oscillators, which are your brain, your heart, and your solar plexus or your gut at a low enough intensity that you actually generate more energy through the breathing and movement than it cost in energy and resources to do the exercise. So their exercise is designed to produce a surplus of energy where working out by definition means to work out, to spend more energy and resources than the exercise returns. That's Mm -hmm. why you have to recover from working out. So each person has to learn through practice and training by someone like me that really knows the science and practice of these things, how to do these things so that they can actually begin to have a sense of awareness of when they actually need working in more than they need working out. And we've also got a very sick culture because we have this whole no pain, no gain kind of attitude. So people just burn themselves completely out and they might get a little success training incorrectly and then maybe get a trophy or set a record, but then they don't realize that that practice cannot be sustained by the body. So they shorten their careers and end up injured and having all sorts of health problems, mental problems, emotional problems, hormonal imbalances. So that's doctor movement in a nutshell. And then doctor quiet, which is the science of effectively using rest and working in is the dynamic component of doctor quiet. So doctor movement has a, a yang component working out and a yin feminine component working in. The feminine component of working out is the masculine component of Dr. Quiet, relatively speaking. So sleep would be the yin component of Dr. Quiet. Working in would be the yang component. 
so much of this stuff didn't just start today with you having all of this. You no. you began this as an athlete. Yes. And your upbringing. So when we all start lifting weights, we come at it from this hyper aggressive. We have to be the biggest, strongest, fastest, meatiest person out there. We can lift everything. There is no off button. Mm-hmm. But while you were going through that, <clears throat> becoming an athlete, learning how strength training worked, yeah. you were also in self-realization camps. Yeah. You were doing this yin side to understanding spirituality at a very young age. Yeah. And I think all of this stuff just kind of slowly progresses to where you are today. Is there any shortcuts to the journey or, you know, how did those, the very first time you sat for 20 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. when does sort of that breakthrough start to happen of, wow, this intensity weightlifting piece that I'm working on is also very similar to me sitting in silence and doing this self work. When did you start to connect the dots on the two and start tying the pieces together? That's a good question. Um, I'll give you a very good answer. Every time I got injured and mm, I had to say, yeah. what the hell did I do wrong? Yeah. And you know, I was a, a highly competitive motocross racer. I've had six concussions racing motorcycles. I've been very badly injured, woke up in the ambulance multiple times and didn't even know how I got there and was covered in, you know, scars and rash from sliding 70 miles an hour down a dirt track covered in rocks and uh i rode in the rodeo and got trampled when i was a kid i i've you know i was a paratrooper had a very bad left shoulder almost had my left shoulder torn out of the socket uh in a parachuting accident um i've broken my left leg in five places cliff diving I've got four broken noses from boxing and kickboxing. I broke my left wrist. I broke my rest left index finger. I've had two broken ribs boxing. Uh, I told you I had a stunt lifting accident and blew my two cervical discs out and tore ligaments in my spine. I've had uh, a variety of injuries from just being young, dumb, and full of cum in a gym and trying to outsmart and outlift much stronger and bigger guys than me. So, you know, even though... I was raised by a mother who was a full-fledged yogi and a very consistent meditator, probably hasn't missed a day of meditation 30 years, and uh, was trained by monks. You know, when you got a lot of testosterone going through you, that all that yogi shit, that's just like stuff your mom makes you do. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, but my mother and my mother and father are farmers. I was raised on a 140-acre sheep farm with uh, with chickens and pigs and horses and cows and we sold produce and we sold firewood so it was a full working farm so there's you know a lot going on there and there's a lot to learn there but you know what I'm telling you is we go through cycles in life I I basically break the the life cycle uh, from birth to death into four phases we have the childhood phase which is where we're codependent on our parents for everything Then we go into what I call the warrior phase. When we go through puberty, we enter the warrior phase. And most of the problems and most of this attitude is part of the warrior phase because our hormones are raging and we're trying to differentiate ourselves from our friends and our family and and our parents especially. We're trying to say, you know, screw you, mom, I'm not doing that. Or screw you, dad, I'm not going to do that. And we're trying to develop a sense of individuality, which has to happen or evolution will halt. Mm -hmm. If we did everything our mom and dad did, then evolution would cease. We'd keep making the same mistakes over and over again that they did. And when the environment changed, we'd all be dead. Um, So the warrior stage of development is when we get into all this ass kicking and trying to prove ourselves. And we're trying to prove ourselves to ourselves and we're trying to prove ourselves to other people. And so we do whatever we got to do to get a sense of recognition or acknowledgement, which means oftentimes doing, pushing the red line, right? Really Mm -hmm. going for it, especially for the males and especially for the high testosterone males. Like, you know, I'm a high testosterone, you know, alpha male type guy. Um, Thus the parasite, you know, being in the 82nd Airborne Division, kickboxing, boxing, motocross racing. I was a stock car racer. I was a drag racer. I mean, I did a lot of crazy shit, rode in the rodeo all just to prove to the world I was a fucking badass and to prove it to myself too, Yeah. right? Not just everyone else, but to me, I had to test myself because I had a deep need to know what I was capable of. I, I really just something, you know, there's there's a lion in there that wants to hunt, so to speak, as a metaphor. Yeah. Um, so then we go out of the uh, warrior stage into the what I call the king and the queen stage. And that's when we usually 
somewhere around 35 to 40 years of age, we've now established ourselves in a profession or a career or a vocation. We can pay our own bills. We usually have our own home, uh, oftentimes a wife and kids. So we have our kingdom, which can be a little kingdom or it can be, you know, you can be a, a wild, out of control person like Donald Trump, who's, you know, got a big kingdom as a metaphor. But in the king and queen stage, you you enter the king and queen stage by becoming an adult, accepting responsibility for yourself, paying your own bills, basically being a responsible contributing adult, but you have a sense of ownership of yourself, a sense of confidence in your skill, that you're a contributor in some way, be it owning a business, being a craftsman like a mechanic or a woodworker. And you have this sense of, okay, I know how to make it through the world now. But we end up finding that, A, we often cannot keep the pace up that it takes to maintain the lifestyle that we developed in our younger years. Yeah. Our overhead gets high. Mm -hmm. um, bills come at us. Things happen. We learn that dealing with people can be very challenging. You know, you start running a big business. You know, I've got employees that have 50, 60,000 uh, clients that have 50, 60,000 employees. Uh, one of my clients owns 50,000 commercial real estate properties, one of the richest men in the world. Mm. Uh, you know, so my point is there's an example of someone who's really in the king stage, right? Or, or the queen stage, but it comes with Remember, when we build our kingdom, we're in the warrior stage. So we're full of fire. I'm going to own this. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to have a big business, right? And then by the time we get to be about, depending on how well you take care of yourself, somewhere between about 45, earlier today, because most people don't know how to take care of themselves, but somewhere between around 40 and 50, we face a thing called a midlife crisis. And we realize it takes so damn much energy to own all this stuff and to protect it and to maintain it and that people can drive you goddamn crazy and you get exhausted and that's where you get trapped if you don't have the willingness to downsize and to get clear on what's really important to you at that time in your life then you go through a crisis and you burn yourself out and a lot of people have to get a disease in order to get the rest you see because it's politically correct to get a disease and go rest but in in, in our culture it's not pretty politically correct to say, well, guys, I'm tired today. I'm not coming to work and you're going to have to work harder by yourself to pay the bills because I need a vacation. Well, one looks at you as soon as the boss walks out the door, nothing gets done. That's one of the things you learn owning a business, yeah. right? When they, when they, when the, when the owner's away, the cats do play. <laughs> so the point I'm making is we reach this point where we cannot maintain that youthful exuberance of the warrior and we've often built such a big kingdom to serve our egos that we don't realize we cannot continue to carry that kind of load. So if we don't go through a process of getting clear about what's honestly important to us and what we really need to, to fulfill our sense of connection to life and to the world and to make our journey, our human journey on earth, meaningful, then we go into a midlife crisis, we get a disease, we get sick, we become someone else's responsibility, we become a codependent. So we fall backwards to the child stage and someone else ends up paying for it or we die. So you're at the transition now to the final stage, which I call the wise man or wise woman stage. And that's where you realize what's most important. So how this ties into what we we're saying is when we're in the child stage, we're just doing what we're told to do. So if you're an athlete, you just do what your coach tells you to do. You don't question it because you don't know what to question. Mm -hmm. When you're in the warrior stage, you do whatever your buddies are doing, but you try to do it better, harder, and faster because if you can do that, then you're acknowledged, you're loved, and you feel valued. And even if it causes you to lose skin, break bones, or whatever, as long as you can figure out how to do it again, you're okay. And you just keep going. And if you got to use drugs or coffee or stimulants or wraps or straps or props or enemas or whatever the hell anyone else is doing you'll do it because <laughs> you're so your identity is so trapped in your performance right that if you can't maintain the performance you actually feel like a nobody so mm -hmm. it, it can lead to a very deep 
emotional crisis and a loss of a sense of self. I feel like he's I describing like me right now. Yeah. Ta- are you <laughs> talking like, to me? Uh, yeah. I'm in the warrior stage, and I don't want to be in the king I, I queen think, stage. Yeah, yes, I, well, you know, that that's a problem, too, because... It is a problem. You know... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more of a problem than anybody. Yeah. If I start crying, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Just> keep going. <laughs> yeah, that's part of the healing, right? That, that's part... Of, this is... Which brings up a point. A man's not really a man until he has equal access to his feminine side. Yeah. We've created an, uh, an entire culture that that uh, downplays a man's ability to be in touch with his emotions and to cry and to share his feelings. And so what happens is all that stuff gets bottled up. And, the, you know, there's a, a, a book in my library, and the title of it is very true, Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. And I work with all sorts of the best athletes in the world and people with diseases, and I would say... 85% of those cases, I have to work on feelings that were buried in men, especially because it was uh, not manly to be honest about their feelings. And so we've got all these tough guys that are like crying little boys inside. And until we can meet the little boy and let him cry and, and really share what it is that we need emotionally or what kind of support we need or be honest about being tired or be honest about honey, I can't keep this business going like this anymore, or whatever it is, if we don't deal with that, then that energy gets trapped in our glands, our organs, and our tissues, and it creates disease. It mirrors itself. The psychic energy mirrors itself in the tissue. So trapped emotions are blockages, which leads to circulatory blockages, which leads to reduction in oxygen levels, which leads to reduction in energy levels, which means the immune system can't support you. And now you've got diseases like cancer going on. So coming you know, into the wise man or wise woman phase for a, for a man especially requires that one be brave enough. And this requires a higher level of bravery than anything in a boxing ring, right? For, for you guys to actually meet the woman inside of you, the feminine, and connect to that person and be honest about it, it would be scarier for you than almost anything any of your buddies could ever throw at you. So much of what you're talking about, I think, is people taking that look inside to find some sort of processing system because everything that goes on in our lives is throwing that dart, that arrow at you, and Mm -hmm. all that stuff is just stored inside. And if we don't have some sort of system in place to work on processing that stress, it's going to show up what we're probably about to get into, but in our organs, in our tissues, in our joints, and that's where these systemic problems come down to. What are some of the pieces that you start to use? Because there's no way someone's going to walk in and go from zero to Paul Check today. But they get a good start, though. Yeah, it'd be a good, be a big afternoon. Um, But (laughs) how... Just being uh, aware, right? The first step of change is awareness, Mm -hmm. right? Being aware. and, And being aware that it's okay to feel shitty but it's also okay to find a way to solve it that isn't painful expensive radical and you know our I call the pain teacher anything that leads us to have to look deeper into ourselves like many of the athletes see me they've seen all sorts of doctors they've had their necks backs shoulders knees looked at 50 times and nobody can figure out why they're still in pain so what I tell them is because you're actually not addressing the problems, you're addressing the symptoms. The pain teacher will not let go of you until you learn the lesson. So what I'm saying is the first step is just being aware that if you're doing the standard physical therapy, stretching, joint mobilizations, you're taking the supplements and doing everything else everyone, everyone tells you to do and it ain't working, it's because you're looking in the wrong area. Yep. I, I would say the... I've seen the biggest improvements in my posture and movement um, after getting organ work or doing some type of emotional release work. Yeah, sure. And um, I guess I want to point this one thing out. I think a lot of times people think they may be in touch with their emotions. Yeah. But when they're describing and expressing their Mm -hmm. emotions, they tend to gravitate towards telling the story about their emotions versus being honest about what's actually going on inside of them. Yes, Can you yeah. comment on that? Well, we when again, once again, we're not taught how to engage our emotions. So one of the key things I teach my clients is to use the words, I'm wanting 
I'm feeling and I'm needing. When you express yourself, especially in relationships, if you say woulda, shoulda, coulda, didn't to yourself or anyone else, that's a judgment. It always creates separation. If you say to your wife in an argument, you should have, you could have, or if you would have done this, I would have, you are now inciting pain. You're pouring gasoline on the fire, and you're not feeling, you're defending. Mm -hmm. If you say, honey, I really want some rest, or I really want dot, 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 honey, I really need, or if you're talking to yourself, if I'm talking to myself, Paul, I really need a longer vacation this year. Paul, I'm really feeling sad about the way my finances are right now. It's scary for me. And I feel tears coming, right? It's just like, can, can I keep this up any longer? I'm really needing some help right now. And maybe we're used to being the badass that carries the whole world on, world on his shoulders, which I've been guilty of many times. But to, to, to really just acknowledge I need help. Somehow I've got to get help from someone I trust and somebody that I can be honest about my feelings with without it disabling them or scaring them, right? That's another problem. There's not many people we can be honest about our inner worlds with without them feeling uncomfortable because if I'm honest with any of you about something that's really painful or scary for me, you then have to be exposed to my pain. And if a person's not whole enough to have empathy for somebody else without getting lost or getting afraid or feeling like they gotta defend themselves, then all they try to do is fix you and tell you why you're stuck or, you know, and that doesn't work. That's like a typical guy telling a woman, well, if you would just eat different, your hormonal cycle would be different and your painful periods would go away, silly. And now you've just lost sex for another week is what you did. <laughs> <laughs> but You went backwards. <laughs> so that's a simple technique. Just deal in wants, feelings, and needs when you're in, with your inner dialogue. And listen carefully for the words I have to. Yeah. The words I have to are the words of a child. It's mom that says you have to clean your room. It's dad that says you have to follow the rules. So part of our spiritual growth is whenever we use the words I have to, to replace them with the words I choose to. And when you realize that what you're wanting, feeling, and needing to recover from what you created is something that you chose to create then you realize you can choose differently. And as scary as it might be, that's part of your spiritual growth. That's part of becoming either a king or a queen at that stage from going warrior to king or queen, or it's from king or queen to wise man. You've got to learn to acknowledge what you've chosen. And as Arnold Patton says beautifully in his Universal Principles, if something's happening in your life and you don't think you wanted it, look carefully at what you're choosing unconsciously. And most of us are so detached from what's often called clinically in psychology the shadow, the parts of ourselves we don't want to acknowledge because we don't like them or they're socially unacceptable that we tend to blame everybody else for those problems. So part of our real healing is acknowledging the dark part of ourselves. So like our insecurities, for example, like a lot of people train like hell in the gym because they're insecure about themselves and without uh, you know, a bigger dick or a bigger bench press, they think they're a nobody. So when they lose their ability to show their dick off or their bench press off, now they don't know who they are anymore, so they go into a crisis of self. So there's a lot of layers of growth and development. And as I often say to my athletes, I don't care if you can squat a thousand pounds, if you can't get along with your wife and kids, what do you got? You're, you're really, now you're just a, you might as well be on Planet of the Apes moving rocks. Yeah, because you ha you've spent all that time to develop something that does not help you grow as a human being. Yeah. While it's on my mind, and I have an answer for your question, I haven't forgot. You see that piece of art right there? Yeah. Okay. This ties into this. This is around the time I was probably 48, 49. I was getting really exhausted. I had been traveling on airplanes nonstop for. 20 plus years all over the world, lecturing constantly, building new programs, training in gyms all over the world, in hotels, parking lots, in staircases, sprinting in underground parking lots, anything I had to do to maintain myself while living on airplanes all the time. And I had to teach my check level four, which is my most advanced class. And quite honestly, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want anybody around me. I just wanted to go smoke infinite 
amounts of pot, lay on the beach, read a book, cry a lot, and be alone. But here I, you know, I got a, here I am on my king or queen stage. I got a huge, huge overhead. At that time, our overhead was probably $100,000 a month before I got paid. Many employees all over the world, 20-something instructors traveling in the world, and here my most advanced students are coming to learn from the master. And I'm like... You hate it. I'm just like, yeah. uh, all I got to teach them right now is how to cry and how to be very careful about what you create in your life because you might get <laughs> nut by your own creation. And so I asked my soul, which is the consciousness within, I just went quiet and said, well, how do I get through this? And my soul said, get out a piece of paper and some color and express your emotions and just be honest about how you feel. And that's what came to me as a vision. And... I sat down, it probably took me half an hour to do that with pastels. And I'll tell you what, it was like somebody flipped a switch in me. I literally painted the emotion out. I painted the pain out. And every time I was on a break, I would come, I had it on my art stand, I would come and just sit there. I might, you know, drink some tea or whatever. And I would just sit there and look at that and be with it. And I could, I just see my, I would see the pain of my love I would see the purpose of my love. The red is the pain of my love. The green is the purpose of my love to connect to other people. The blue is my love of teaching and the white is my love of achieving higher consciousness. And the spiral is the spiral of life, the growth spiral. And the tunnel is the tunnel of the unknown because nobody on this planet knows where the hell we're going. But we're traveling at 68,000 miles an hour and nobody's at the wheel. <laughs> 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 yeah. While well, we're destroying the spaceship. I um I want, I want to go back a little bit. You said can something. Can I can I answer go, yes, please. Bob One's question? <laughs> Anders, Bob One. Um the the simple answer and what I created for the world was my four doctors system and I have an ebook called The Last Four Doctors Lever Need How to Get Healthy Now which teaches you how to be aware of those four doctors, what the essentials are, and gives you very simple, practical guidance. I mean, it, uh, uh, an edu uh, uh, you know, a decently intelligent 12-year-old could probably understand the book, but it shows you the four essentials that you must have to have a, a healthy living philosophy. I don't care what religion you study, what martial art you study. If you don't have clear awareness of what happy making is for you, if you don't have clear connection to your body and awareness of what you need to eat and how you need to hydrate yourself, if you don't know how to use exercise intelligently to keep yourself healthy, let alone strong and fit, but healthy, and if you don't know how to use rest, you have a disabled philosophy. If you think of a wheel with only four spokes, if you remove any one of those spokes, it turns into a triangle quite quickly, and those don't roll well. So if you lose awareness and practice of what is happy making, how do I use exercise intelligently? How do I eat intelligently? And how do I rest intelligently? Every one of those spokes that's disabled creates tremendous amount of resistance in your life and the pain teacher comes to kick your ass until you finally find a doctor or a therapist that educates you on what you need to know. But we also have a drug-happy culture that's been conditioned to sell their problems to doctors. So people want to sell their problems, want to medicate their problems to make them go away so they can keep living a dysfunctional philosophy. So ultimately we get to the point where the drugs and the pills and the undereducated doctors and therapists don't work and we get pushed so deeply into ourselves we have to figure it out. So some people get so exhausted that they simply have to skip work for a couple of days a week and after sleeping for two days they wake up and go, oh my God, I feel so much fucking better. Yeah. Oh, I just think maybe I wasn't getting enough sleep. And the next time they start feeling shitty, they go, oh my God, I'm starting to feel terrible. I, I got to take a couple of days off and go to sleep again. And they finally wake up one day and go, wow, sleep's the most important thing. I better stop fucking around and messing my sleep up with late night coffee and sugar and crap. So the pain teacher will not stop until you get it or you die. So the answer to your question is, how do we begin to learn that? The first thing you got to do is be aware that those four essential categories of a living philosophy 
have got to be addressed openly and honestly or you will become very expensive to yourself yeah. and broken and sad. Yeah. And the worse you get, the worse your relationships get. And this whole, these, these four principles have kind of created this totem pole that we are staring at, I think. Mm-mm. No, that's a different thing. No, we'll talk about it in a second. The, the, the totem pole... That was a terrible can, segue. Can, can, <laughs> Sorry. I, I want to get in the totem I pole, really, but I, yeah. before, before we go too long, uh, you were talking about uh, people training out of insecurity versus mm-hmm. what? Uh, versus a willingness to explore their potential. And how does somebody know? I mean, what are, what are some signs that somebody is training out of insecurity? Maybe, maybe I think I'm exploring my potential, but I'm really... Oh, I'll give you a simple sign. Perfect. Someone who's training to explore their potential doesn't get upset when they get beat by somebody. They just say, well, that was the best I could do today. And that guy's fucking good. Congratulations. Yeah. When I was a competitive fighter, I was a hard trainer. You know, I grew up on a farm. My father's a extraordinary ass-kicking drill sergeant that you do not say no to. You do not talk back to. You do exactly what you're told when you're told or you end up in a hospital. And he's a six foot four, 220-pound ex-professional rodeo rider and he's fast as a cat and can pick you up with one arm and throw you on the fucking roof of a house. So uh, when I was young, I learned that I wanted to explore my potential because the threat of being in the environment of my father was such that I learned that eventually one day I was going to have to intervene or he might kill somebody you know he might you know he might hurt somebody so bad so seeing my mother get slapped around like a rag doll as you can imagine by the time you're about 13 years of age and your hormones turn on something inside you says I can't just put up with this so I went on a quest to study martial arts and boxing to prepare myself for the day that I had to confront him and I wanted to do it as quickly as possible so I had a pursuit for the need of safety But I also had a deep interest, for example, when I was in martial arts and we were breaking boards and bricks and things like that. Yeah, I wanted to break more boards than anybody else because I'm a healthy male. But I also thought, well, what the hell, what is it, what am I capable of doing? This is amazing because I was breaking stuff that I never knew I could break. So it opened up this kind of explorative frontier. So if one of my buddies broke more bricks or boards than I did, I didn't get pissed off. I said, well, how the hell did you do that? And he, I said, what am I doing wrong? And he might say, well, Paul, you don't have enough snap in your delivery. You're trying to use force. You've got to put, you got to work through it. You've got to put your intention on the other side of it. So I would be more interested in how they were doing it, but wasn't so disabled by the fact that I got beat. Of course, I wanted to win. And I would think, okay, I've got to train harder and train better. And I've got to study more. I've got to learn how to eat better or train better or do whatever I can do to beat them. But I didn't get disabled by it. I didn't get feel weaker. I didn't feel less in love with myself. I didn't feel like I was less of a person. So if a person's identity is attached to their performance and losing makes them feel less of a person or more insecure in themselves, then they're marching down a very dangerous road because... There's always someone faster. There's <laughs> always someone stronger. There's always someone better. There's always someone better in bed that your girlfriend will hear about. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is, <laughs> you know. Just y- describing my 2016. <laughs> 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 you know, but, but do you see the difference there? If, if, we are, if our sense of self-worth and self-esteem is low, we can use athletics to compensate for that. But it, it's kind of like, now women, to give you a correlation, women use their beauty to do this, mm-hmm. right? They use beauty as power. So many of my clients over the years who are dealing with anxiety and depression are women that are now in their 40s and their boobs are falling and their ass is falling and they're taking all the supplements and they're going to kettlebell classes and <laughs> they're now like, you know, they're fit-looking mothers you know but they're frustrated because 
the young soul of them still wants the young, healthy men to be attracted to them, but they're not. They're attracted to their daughters. Mm -hmm. So as their beauty goes away, it's like a man's power going away. So their beauty power is the functional equivalent of a man's physical power or his badass ability as a martial artist or whatever he is. So they go through a crisis as well, and there's other things, but do you see that if we aren't connected to the depth of ourselves and if our interest isn't truly oriented towards being all that we can be as an exploration of ourselves, then we get lost in needing to achieve whatever we've got to achieve to get other people's approval, attention, recognition, and love. And because that's an external source of love, it halts your spiritual development because now you're really stuck spiritually at the development of a child that needs mommy and daddy's approval to be feel good about itself. So we don't realize we've just projected our childhood into our adulthood and we're not an adult yet. So that's hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around because they, what do you mean I'm not an adult? You know, and then they'll give you 50 reasons why they are. And I'll say, well, then why are you so upset that your boobs are sagging? <laughs> or why are you so damn upset that your dick doesn't work now? And why do you have to take, uh, if uh, you know, whatever it is that uh, brain farting, you know, the dick drug. Uh, Viagra. Viagra. Viagra, right? Like I've, I've had 18 and 19-year-old athletes ask me how to get off of Viagra. Whoa. I'm like, are you kidding me? When I was 20 years old, I could use my dick as a dinner bell. <laughs> Ring it, and it would sound like a Tibetan bowl. <laughs> you know, and here the, you got 18 and 19 year old guys that should be at the prime of their life, and they're, they're honestly having to take drugs to have sex. I mean, that's how far off the path we've mm. become. Mm. And these guys are the ones using all the supplements and all the scientifically validated stuff. Right. Well, every drug on the market that ever had to be taken off the market was scientifically validated first. So there's an example. And the other problem with all the scientific validation is about every five years, everything that was scientifically true yesterday becomes not true because we learn more about systems integration. And what we thought was the ironclad truth turns out to be not the truth. So my only point that I'm trying to make is the answer of how do you distinguish when your pursuit is actually healthy, or unhealthy, or whether it's positive or potentially negative or going to come back and bite you. And the difference is, and, and the signifier I gave is if you, if you, if losing leaves you feeling less of yourself, but you know you're doing the best job you can, then you're trying to win for the wrong reasons. If you're trying to be stronger, faster, or smarter for those reasons, you can never win that battle. It's, a, it's like you're marching toward a guillotine and you don't know it. But if you're really in the pursuit of just being the best that you can be, and the only person you've got to talk to, and this is one of the reasons I got out of team sports. It used to drive me nuts when guys in team sports wouldn't play hard, and I knew it, and we would get beat. And I'm like playing football, and they're kind of running half-ass, so they didn't care. I'm like, I am here to win. It's important to me to win. That's what a competition's about. So team sports irritated me as a young man, and I was raised by a man that didn't accept half-ass performances for an answer. So I came from an environment where you didn't perform half-ass. You just didn't, or you were hurt. So I had a hard time transitioning into the team sport with, with all these kind of, oh, it's okay, it's just a game. Well, it's not, not it's just a game. We're, we're here to win the championship. We're not here to just play games. We're here to win. That's what a team's for. So I got so irritated that I said, well, look, I got to get into boxing and kickboxing and motocross racing because if I'm racing a motorcycle, if I lose, it's my fault. If I yep. lose in a boxing ring, it's my fault. And so my strategy in boxing was you might be a better boxer than me, but I will make myself so fit that if you don't knock me out, I will get you so tired by the third round, you won't be able to hold your hands up and I'm going to hurt you. And that's how I became a successful boxer. You know, I didn't start boxing till I was 12, but when I was on the Army boxing team, we had guys that were 22 years old with 320 fights under their belt wow. that yeah. started fighting when they were six. Mm. So I got guys in there, and even though I'm good enough to be on the Army boxing team, I got guys that could hit me three times before I could hit them once. And I'm like, holy shit. So I had to develop a strategy, 
and my strategy was do everything you can do to make yourself the best you can be and know if you get beat. My philosophy was if you're going to beat me, you're going to have to earn it. And the point that I'm tying this into here is if someone beat me in a boxing ring or in a kickboxing match, they're the first person I wanted to give a hug to, even a kiss, because I knew how hard they had to work to get there. Mm. Because my philosophy is my job as an athlete is to give you maximum opportunity to lose. You understand? Oh, yeah. But at the same time, what I'm saying is if I lost, I didn't lose my sense of self-esteem. I said, where do I need to study? Th I just met my master. If this guy could beat me around that motocross track, beat me in boxing or anything, I just met a teacher and I would study them and I would grow from it. Some can't handle that. They lose. I've watched athletes get injured and, and or get beat and they get so emotionally broken that they go into states of depression because they don't have all the pats on the back anymore. They're not the golden boy. And now they don't know who they are anymore. They don't have any sense of self-worth. So the next thing you know, they're on drugs or they're trying to take shortcuts using steroids or whatever it takes. And then that opens up a whole other can of worms. So they just keep drilling themselves deeper and deeper and getting further and further away from the core of their true being is what I'm saying. Yeah. So you seem to be extremely well-educated despite not having graduated high school, which I'm not sure if you said that on, on the show, but you didn't graduate high school, but you're, you're phenomenally well-educated in, in many different categories. Like mm -hmm. if you look around the room, if you're watching the video, we're, we're essentially in a library. The whole damn house is a library. Yeah. There's, there's bookcases in that room. They're all packed. Yeah. You know, well, what have you learned about educating yourself that, that people that are just, just beginning their world, their, their journey rather into the world of health and fitness or their, they're, they've gotten out of college and they've got their feet on the ground with a career and they want to have a family and the whole deal, but they, but they, they want to, to pursue mastery in, in whatever they want to pursue it in the, but they, and they want to educate themselves. Like, what's the best way to do that in your mind? Yeah, that's a very good question. I actually have a course called How to Learn. It's a PPS Success Mastery Lesson 7, I believe. So if you go to mm. ppssuccess.com, that's a website where I put 12 lessons together based on the 12 most common things I saw stopping people from living a healthy life, achieving their dreams, or being successful in their careers or their sports. And, and I have a whole lesson on how to learn because I repeatedly would <laughs> have conversations with medical doctors and scientists and all sorts of people that would be at lectures of mine and go like, where in the fuck did you learn all this stuff? So the answer is this. First of all, I'll preface this by saying, Our educational system is very dysfunctional. It teaches you what to learn, but does not teach you how to learn. They tell you what books you must read, what tests you have to pass. But oftentimes that stuff in the real world doesn't help you at all, right? So once I got to the point in high school, which is when I, well, first of all, by the time I got to the 10th grade, my, my girlfriend got pregnant and I became a dad when I just turned 18. So I just, and I'd become so frustrated because teachers couldn't answer my questions. They got pissed off me. Same thing happened to me in church when I'd ask questions, you know. I'd ask some very interesting questions, and I wouldn't get very well-received answers. So uh, once we went to Self-Realization Fellowship, that all healed because the monks were very open and honest. But the people in the Christian churches were very, very um, unreceptive to young minds that ask deep questions. But the point that I'm leading towards here is... We have a system that tells us what to study, but it often doesn't work. I was raised on a farm where my father would say, the baler's fixed, I'll be back in an hour. Or the, the baler's broken, I'll be back in an hour. It better be fixed. Okay, what he meant was, if it's not fixed when I come back in an hour, you're going to be broken. So I learned, if you have to beg, borrow, steal, run to the neighbor's house, talk to the neighbor about why the baler won't work or why the how the fan came uh, the fan belt came off the drive pulley or whatever the hell I learned do it do it fast think on your feet be practical so I learned on a farm you doesn't you can read all the books you want and why a, 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 an animal has hoof rot but if you fart around reading books and not getting something done to fix the problem you lose all your animals so in in a, an environment where you depend on your crops and you depend on your animals you can't get into a bunch of fancy dancy theories like they do in agricultural programs in universities. You gotta keep the animals alive or you starve to death. So I learned to think practically 
and test things efficiently and go with what works. So how I developed my knowledge when I became the trainer of the Army boxing team, I also took over massage therapy, studied massage therapy, practiced it, and did a two-year internship with a team doctor who was an osteopathic physician. So what I did was I used the same principles of learning that I'd used in my youth in, on the farm and in my exploration of athletics, studying diet, studying exercise, which is to study the people that were getting the best results and ask them how they did it. But then I don't have to read 50 books. I just went to the person that already done all that and said, oh, that's all bullshit. Just do this. But the key thing is this. I developed a tremendous amount of practical knowledge because my living was based on getting results as a therapist and as a conditioning coach or a coach. And so what I did is whenever I came into some kind of a challenge, be it an athlete that was having chronic pain or couldn't achieve a certain objective and get past a plateau or somebody that had an internal illness nobody could figure out, which might have been a parasite infection, I studied exactly what I had to study based on what the situation was. So I would study your symptoms, I would go to a medical library, and would look up anything that talked about those symptoms, and the next thing you know I'd find, well, there's 14 different things that can cause that, and then I would study those 14 different things and say, okay, that says this happens when you're in a dirty house where there's mold growing in the bathroom, dot, dot. So then I would say, okay, let's check your house. And lo and behold, there'd be black mold in the shower and in, on, in the sinks. And I realized they got a serious fungal infection. They're being poisoned by mycotoxin. Now, I might have had to go through four years of university and still wouldn't have learned that. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I did what I would call situational research. What is the situation at hand and what can I take as indicators? What are the symptoms? What are the challenges we're facing? And who has the most knowledge on those topics? Which medical professional, which strength and conditioning professional, which coaching, which sport, whatever. And so I, all these books are all the research that I did into myriads of these types of situational experiences. And after a while, you start to realize, wow, all sorts of things lead back to food. All sorts of things lead back to water. All sorts of things lead back to sleep. And all sorts of things lead back to over or under exercising, as an example. So those were the common denominators. For example, I developed a system of movement called the primal pattern movement system. And what I did is I did, I studied the science of human movement and, and looked at it scientifically, but I could not find the answers to my questions. So what I did is I studied developmental man and my wife, Penny, has a master's degree in biological anthropology. So I'd figured this out before I met her, but when I talked to her about how I figured this all out, it was very fun because she could show me uh, a more scientific academic concepts that would reinforce what I'd figured out on my own, which she was always quite impressed with. She's like, Paul, you never set foot in a university. You're talking to me about stuff that professors don't even talk about. And I said, well, yeah, I ask myself a lot of questions. I pretend I am that man. So what I did is I... I, and here's how it happened as a segue here. Um, when I came to work for the largest physical therapy clinic in San Diego in 1986, I think it was, 86, 88, January 88, I was the first massage therapist ever to be hired by a sports and orthopedic physical therapy clinic in San Diego. And it was considered weird and why would you ever hire a massage therapist? They're hippie nobodies, right? But the owner of the clinic had had four knee surgeries. None of her 22 physical therapists with master's degrees or whatever could figure out what was wrong. The surgeon was confused. He had to manipulate her knee twice. And he said to her, her name's Kathy Grace. He said, Kathy, if we have to manipulate your knee again, the damage could be catastrophic. You may never be able to play golf or tennis again. Well, I had rehabilitated uh, an elite level runner who was sponsored by Nike named Kevin McCary from bilateral Achilles problems because nobody could figure him out. And I got that guy back in the game and running within a few weeks. So he, when he found out about this, said to Kathy, he said, I know a guy you got to go see. He does all sorts of stuff I've never heard of before, but it works. So on my first visit, I got eight degrees more range of motion out of her knee than they'd gotten in three months of therapy. And she was shocked. And she said to me, Paul, I've never seen any of these techniques before. 
where'd you learn them? I said, I learned them by just listening to your body. I just pay attention. I connect to the body and ask it what it wants to need. I said, you have a lot of fascial binding. You've got deep fascial adhesions. I said, the techniques I'm using on you are classically called rolfing techniques and other techniques as well. But, but the long and the short of it, she, I rehabbed her and got her back. And the surgeon said, I want to meet this guy. Whoever did this, I want to meet him. So she brought me in to meet the surgeon. Well, they offered me a job. I got to work with 22 physical therapists and trainers. But what happened was because the doctors are so uneducated about exercise, I'm rehabbing all these spinal injuries and I'm giving them squats and, and, and deadlifts and cable pushes and pulls and they're freaking out. They're like, what the hell are you doing? You can't do that to people. I said, really? Why don't you go ask Mrs. Smith how she's doing? I said, ask every one of them. Every one of them was doing better and getting better faster than they'd ever gotten. And they were completely confused. So the head physical therapist said, Paul, we really need you to explain to us how it is that you choose these exercises and how you do it without people getting hurt. Well, what I had done is I had been going through a process inside myself, which is based on what do we have to do to survive in nature? You know, it's doc doctors used to say to me, well, nobody should be squatting in the gym when they have a back injury. I said, well, I have a question for you. Have you ever seen anyone have a shit standing up? <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen anyone levitate into their car? Because not only do you have to do a squat when you get into your car, you've got to do a single-legged squat with a lateral shift and a twist coupled with a side bend. So if you're telling me this person can't do a squat with a dowel rod on their back and you've just done surgery on their spine, I got news for you. How are they going to get in out of that car without hurting themselves? How are they going to pick up their kids? How are they going to get on off the toilet? And they look at me like I'm from outer space. I'm like, these are basic damn questions that you should have been asking long before you even got your medical degree. Because it means you are not paying attention to anything once that person leaves that operating table and you're making shitloads of money and all these re-injuries, which is unethical. So the point I'm making is what, I, what happened was Chris Siegel, the head physical therapist, who was very smart with a master's degree and, and very top-notch woman who was very open to me, unlike a lot of them, they fought with me like cats and dogs, but they learned the hard way that they should pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> I used to tell them, you guys could never run a farm. You'd all starve to death. Uh, all you'd be doing is ultrasounding the cows to death. <laughs> Burn their titties off. So, <laughs> you know, like I used to ask them, why are you using ultrasound on hypermobile joints? Ultrasound produces heat in tissues. Heat causes fascia to lengthen. And you're doing it on people who have seriously loose knee joints, shoulder joints. I said, you know, they're just doing what they were taught to do in school. They didn't think about it. This is what, anyhow, the point is, they said, we need you to teach us how it is you're doing all this exercise selection because we don't understand it. So I'd never had to teach a class to a bunch of physical therapists like that before to explain what I used to do as an internal process. So what I did is I got a bunch of pen boards. I had like three big full-size pen boards out. I wrote down every single exercise I could think of, and it was a lot. The pen boards were packed. And then I said, what is the common denominator amongst all these exercises with the one question in mind? What would we have to do to survive in nature? So to make a long story short, I kept connecting all the exercises and reducing them down to their essentials, and I came up with seven movement patterns that all of them were derivatives of squatting, lunging, bending, pushing, pulling, and twisting while standing on your own feet, because in nature there is no chairs or leg presses to Smith machines to balance you. So I said, what I do whenever I have a patient is I look to see which of these key movements, and now that I've shown you that these 350 or 400 or 500 or 600 exercises all come from those generalized motor programs, which is the actual term, I choose which pattern they're the weakest in and need the most improvement in, and I build them up. So if I have to have someone hold two dowel rods and do a squat, even though they now have a bigger base of support, the dowel rods still move. That's far, far more neurologically complex and rich than a Smith machine because as soon as you lean against something that's stable, your core shuts off and your balance center shut off. So you've now just cut out half the brain, and no matter how strong you are in a Smith machine, you can't do that. Your brain cannot apply force where you cannot stabilize your joints because you'll injure yourself. Mm -hmm. So I told, I showed them that, that you, there's seven key movement patterns that everything else is an emergence of, unless you have special, what I call a specialized pattern like figure skating, 
uh, skateboarding, uh, uh, water skiing. Then you have what I call specialized patterns where you have potential for squat, lunge, bend, push, pulling, and twisting, but you have unusual patterns that require a very specific skill set that would not have been necessary to survive in nature. So for certain athletic applications, I have to do what I call uh, specialized pattern training, which those are s skills the nervous system has to learn. To, to finish the point, though, yeah. this is just an example of how my farm boy, not academically trained mind would process information and it helped me help a lot of people that people with very fancy degrees could not help because they had not learned how to think and they had learned what to think. And when they were taught what to think, they were taught what to think by other people that also weren't grounded in reality and were doing so much research that they got detached from reality. And though it looks good on paper, like oh, look at thousands of isokinetic studies. Physical therapy used to be all isokinetic. Isokinetic means constant speed. I've never met a single person in the world that functions isokinetically, yet they would rehab them on isokinetics. I'm like, there's no way that's going to work. You're using a technology that is actually abnormal. The closest thing you can get to isokinetics is being a fish or a rower because the water creates constant resistance. But I, I, I would see people get 300% improvements in isokinetic strength, but they could not even get a 5% improvement in picking up a box with weight in it. So it didn't make any sense to me. So I built the whole Czech Institute system by studying situations and looking into and asking anybody that had knowledge about anything that my own research said, for example, if I had to talk to a mycologist to find out, well, what kind of mold do I need to be worried about and how do I figure out what it, I would hire a mycologist. I would pay them for their time or I would study mycology journals. That's how I built the entire institute and that's how I grow all my knowledge and that's what all these thousands of books surrounding you are is information by people that I respected enough to study. So I do want to dig into this totem pole model yeah. that, we, that we printed out here in a can second. I, but can I have a, a, a moment to go alleviate the pressure in my bladder? Sure. Yeah. You want a quick break and then Let's we'll, we'll check out the totem pole model? Yeah. Awesome. Mm. Cool. Thanks for watching the show. If you'd like to learn more about how to improve your snatch, clean, and jerk, we have a free 55-page ebook you can get at flightweightlifting.com. It has sample programming specifically for weightlifting. Uh, weightlifting how-to technique videos and other tips on how to improve all of your lifts. Go to flightweightlifting.com and you can download that ebook for free. Download it now. <laughs> and we're back <laughs> with uh, Paul Chuck. Can we get into... He said he had a couple of questions. Oh, you want to hit that oh, before I, we... Uh, I had a very small question about one of the points we left off on. You said you had seven primary movement patterns or however you described it, but yep. then you said squatting, hing hinging, lunging, squatting, pressing, pulling, squatting, bending. Squatting, lunging, bending. Right. Pushing, right. pulling, and twisting. Twisting, and that was six. Seven. Squat, lunge, bend, push, pull, twist. Mm. Oh, yeah, is it six? Squat, lunge, bend, push, pull, twist. Oh, okay, it is six. Okay, I thought, I thought <laughs> we missed one. Okay, I, cool. I, I brain farted there. I just counted too quickly. In okay. the break, we had our statistician. Oh, sorry, yes. We were counting uh, them uh, up. Yes, <laughs> you're right. You're <laughs> right. I, I left one out. Oh, okay. Gate. Gate, uh, okay. Walking. Mm. Walking, oh, okay. walking yeah. running. Got I left yeah. one out. Um. You know, because I know this stuff so intimately, I don't think about it like that anymore. But the seventh pattern is gait. And here's an interesting thing I'll tell you since you're talking about that. I'll tell you what what's one of the most powerful experiences you can have as a pioneer of anything. I told you how I figured this all out, right? Remember that discussion? Writing how does how does a man how does man what does a man have to do, a human have to do to survive in nature? And so I wrote all the things down, like, you know, I just looked at everything, and I, and I grew up on, in, on Vancouver Island, I've, I'm, I'm a hunter, I know what it's like to be out in the woods, I've done all sorts of journeys out in the woods for multiple days at a time, I was a soldier, I was in the 82nd Airborne Division, so I know what it's like to be out in the woods, right? So I just th went through the process, well, you know, you're walking on a trail, you come to a great big log, you got to get over it, so you have to use a lunging type movement, you have to... If you kill an animal, you can't just say, follow me home so I can eat you. You've got to pack it home. And how do you pick it up? You've got to bend over to pick it up. You've got to get it up on your back. 
you can't walk without twisting. Every single joint in your body functions on what's called triplanar movement, which means there's always flexion, extension, side bending, and rotation, no matter what you think. Even when you're bending forward in the sagittal plane, there's triplanar movements going on because nobody's perfectly symmetrical in their body, for example. So check this out. In 2000, I think it was, I did an advanced training program for seven days in the Czech Republic with two of my heroes, Vladimir Yonda, who's a serious pioneer of musculoskeletal medicine, and uh, Carol Levitt, who was his primary teacher and is one of the people whose work I studied quite a lot to understand the integration of the glands, the organs, and the musculoskeletal system. You can look at his book, Manipulative Therapy and the Rehabilitation of the Locomotor System, which is very, very deep and comprehensive and expensive. Um, so they gave an advanced training at the Charles Hospital in um, Prague. And part of it was, in that hospital, was where Dr. Voita, who had done 50 years of research on child development, and had developed an entire system of infant development <clears throat> that can be used to rehabilitate people from spinal cord injuries, brain injuries, comas. And he found there's reflex points on the body that you can touch, and if you touch them in the right sequence, it activates programs in the brain and spinal cord that activate movement patterns that are infant movement patterns. The mm. very patterns an infant has to go through to integrate their musculoskeletal, hormonal, nervous, and biological systems. So I was so fascinated by this, I bought piles of books on infant development and studied it extensively. I got them all in the library if you want to see them. And lo and behold, guess what I found out? There are seven movements that an infant has to go through. Squatting, lunging, bending, pushing, pulling, and twisting. And I was able to correlate those with my primal pattern system, so I developed my own system of teaching infant development through several years of research and the training at the Czech Republic and was able to show that exactly the seven movement patterns that we have to have to survive in nature are the ones that an infant has to go through to integrate their musculoskeletal brain, nervous system, hormonal system, and biological systems. And I developed a whole system of infant development movement assessment and was able to apply it to athletes and people worldwide and could show exactly where they did not do infant development correctly because of environmental stressors such as hard floors that kids can't crawl on because it hurts their knees so they skip developmental steps or inflammation in the guts. I've rehabbed kids that had terrible back and hip pain and nobody could figure out but they didn't realize the child was gluten intolerant which was stopping the child from being able to rotate and shutting its core down oh, wow. so it wouldn't do key movement patterns, couldn't walk correctly. I saved people from all sorts of surgical procedures that the doctors were going to do on them by identifying where they did not develop their motor skills correctly. But the key point, the eureka moment, is when I figured out that the same exact movement patterns are what we go through as children that I had identified as primal pattern movements when I was like 26 or 7 years old by doing a reductive analysis without any awareness of it, then you see that your intuition's working. Then you realize that having an open mind and observing and paying attention and practicing will always take you where you need to go. And it's far more important to do that than to listen to some dude standing in front of a class called a professor telling you all the shit that you're supposed to know when most of them can't even demonstrate any evidence of that themselves. Like I've seen lots of experts on weightlifting that can't lift weights Right, so yeah. <laughs> like most of them, yeah. they're broken. We, we, yeah, we, are, we all went through undergrad and graduate school for for kinesiology, and a lot of people that graduated with us, they have degrees mm -hmm. in the field, and they have no idea how to train. Exactly, I've had numerous cases of people with master's degrees in exercise and sports science, kinesiology, and all sorts of degrees, who have told me they learned more in one of my three day workshops than they did in their entire master's degree program, and it's practical, it works. And this goes back to learning. You see, I studied situationally, and instead of listening to professors, I said, who is the best person in the world at this problem? And I fortunately was making enough money that I could hire these people for a day at a time, whether it cost sometimes two grand a day to go sit and ask questions and, and learn. So I went right to the masters. And my whole system is really a collection of the knowledge I gained from studying the masters. <laughs> Rarely ever were they academic. 
people. I mean, they might have had a degree, but they were way past all that. They just said, that stuff doesn't work. Or that part did, but that part didn't. Well, where does so much of the stuff that you're working on, it clearly it is not built in academia, or it's, it's I guess you could say it's supported by academia. Some but, of it is, yeah. It's, very, um, yeah. It's, it's not that academia is bad. It's just that it doesn't make the gap to practical applications, okay. and it often is so segmented, it makes the mistake of believing partial truths as facts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it takes someone with more processing power or power of integration and general knowledge of multiple fields to say, okay, that fits, but only to this point, and you got to add the knowledge of this. For example, yeah. you have to have a knowledge of how the glands and the organs work for an athlete to achieve optimal strength, or they will break down, and they will not know how to eat right, and they won't know the ramifications of all their protein powders and blah, 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 yeah. right? So there's a lot of great knowledge, and I've studied massive amounts of science, and I am not against science. I just say you have to be very careful with how you use it because scientific studies are like knives. You've got to be careful with a knife. It can be a helpful tool, but it can be a dangerous tool, right? Mm. So that's really the comment on that. Yep. Uh, All right. Yeah. Now's the time. Get after it. We are we are gonna attack we are this, going this to totem pole this model of yours. Okay, for, so first of all, what do you actually call it? Is it called it's totem called pole? The, it's called the check totem pole. Okay. Yeah. So so what is it? How did you develop it? And, and wh- it's a beautiful model. Thank you. By the way. So what does it all mean though? And by the way, we're gonna have we're gonna give you access to this? Yeah, the, there's a PDF of this on the yeah. show notes. So if you just go to barbershop.com slash check C H E K, then you can download the PDF and see what we're talking about. Okay, so here's what happened. First of all, when I got out of the Army, I, I needed to get a license to practice professionally, and I wanted to study sports massage therapy. So I did research all over the United States to see who had the best sports massage therapy school. And the one that I felt was the best, based on my knowledge and investigation and to what I wanted to learn was the Sports Massage Training Institute in, and it was in either Costa Mesa or Encinitas. They had two, and it was owned by a lady named Mike Hungerford, who was a Russian-trained massage therapist. And I don't know if you know this, but it takes seven years of training in Russia to get your massage therapy license, and they're treated as equal to medical doctors in wow. Russia. Wow. Dang. I didn't know it. Yeah. So when I went to the Sports Massage Training Institute, it was a very good school, very comprehensive, multiple teachers that were practicing professionals, and it covered joint mobilization, stretching, a wide variety of techniques, Syriax deep tissue therapy, corrective techniques. It was 350 hours of very good, high-quality, intensive training. And there, because massage, at that time, there was like five massage therapy schools in San Diego alone. If you open up the San Diego paper and go to the massage therapy section, there's like five, maybe ten rows of massage therapists. So the point is, the market was just flooded with massage therapists in town. So I thought, well, the only way I'm going to make a living is to specialize in problem cases. So I just had a deep sense of trust because I'd had such great work with the boxers and gotten such acclaim from my work with the boxers and uh, accolades from generals and from medical doctors working with the sports teams and, and they shit. They said, Paul, since you've been the trainer of the team, our injury rates dropped down to almost nothing compared to before you started. And I said I did two years of training with an osteopathic physician. So I already had an inner sense that I could help a lot of people because I could see what was being missed in all these traditional therapeutic approaches, just like I got the job working at Sports and Orthopedic Physical Therapy. She actually hired me away from the uh, chiropractic office where I worked for a guy named Dr. Keith Jeffers who specialized in, in athletes, but especially running athletes. And he was one of the teachers in school and he had an Achilles problem that nobody could figure out. So when I fixed him up, he said, I want you to come work for me. And so um, what I did is I went all over San Diego. I made up business cards and brochures and I went to every doctor, every physical therapist, every chiropractor and even massage therapist I could find and said, give me the toughest patients you got. Give me the people that when you look on your schedule and you see that person's name, you go, oh, not them again because they're not responding to therapy and you got nothing to lose. Yeah. And I would offer a money-back guarantee. If I didn't give you results that you were happy with, I'd give you your money back. I've been doing that most of my career. 
So I started getting all these patients. And I, after a while, I started, you know, having a list of people that would, would vouch for me. So, yes, this guy's for real because I'd rehabilitated them. And some of them were doctors and physical therapists. So the point is I built this practice of very complicated people. I mean, some of these people would come to me with two medical files, two inches thick, and it would take me a week to read all the studies, all the blood samples, all the x-rays, scanogram, you name it, uh, MRIs. I'd have to study a lot because they were very complicated people. So after a few years of this and having these complicated people, I started saying, Jesus, Murphy, this person's got this chronic back pain. They've seen 50 chiropractors. They've seen neurologists. So I started saying, what's missing? What's missing? And, and so then I would start studying, like I said, what, can, what influences the low back? So you find, for example... If when a woman's premenstrual and the uterus is inflamed, they chronic they have chronic commonly have back pain and their legs get weak and their core stability goes down because the uterus reflexes through the entire sciatic distribution all the way to the toes right to the belly button. It affects the suboccipital region and women oftentimes have a hard time keeping their atlas in position when they're premenstrual because of the effects of estrogen and the atlas is the most unstable vertebra in the body so if your structure is not well aligned it pops out and it pinches the spinal cord and causes all sorts of problems so what i would do is i would start saying okay well this system connects to that this woman's got menstrual dysregulation what causes menstrual okay it, diet and lifestyle factors caffeine some of the things we we're talking about so i started noticing that if somebody has a uterus problem, that you cannot rehab them from an ACL injury if their uterus is inflamed because they can't stabilize. If you've got back problems, you can't do it because the, infl because the organs have a reflex control of the muscles. And, and I learned this studying Byron Robinson MD's book, The Abdominal and Pelvic Brain, that I just showed you, the first edition, 1899, yeah. second edition, 1907. I studied a lot of old medical books because back then those doctors were actually doing research to help people not to make money there's a big difference you understand that mm -hmm. they weren't being paid by people to prove that some drug or some machine or some gadget worked so they were doing honest research so a lot of the older medical books are loaded with fantastic stuff so then i i came to the conclusion okay i need to look into organs and what I found studying Byron Robinson MD's work is that the autonomic nervous system is designed so that whenever there's inflammation or stress in an organ, it will downregulate the flow of, uh, of blood to any muscle on the same nerve channel because organs borrow their sensory neurons from the musculoskeletal system, which is why when a person's having a heart attack, they feel the pain in their chest in the left arm. No one says my heart hurts. They have terrible pain in their chest in their left arm. The uterus borrows its sensory nerve endings from the lower segments of the uh, sympathetic chain system, which feed the legs, for example, and the lower abdomen and the back. So what Robinson showed way back then is that if there's ever a competition between muscles and organs for blood supply, nutrients, and waste removal, the autonomic system will starve out the muscles to make sure that the organs and glands have maximum opportunity to heal. So I learned, as an example, you cannot effectively rehabilitate any musculoskeletal problem without a complete analysis of the gland and organ functions because they control the musculoskeletal system. And then when you think about it, watch this. When you are hungry and your stomach's empty, what does it make your arms and legs want to do? Grab food. Go hunting is would be the answer. <laughs> you you got to go catch it, right? At Whole Foods, you, usually. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but our nervous system was yeah. wired developmentally. So when we're stomach's empty, all of a sudden we're very motivated to go hunting and we can't fart around, so it really activates the body. When your penis gets hard, what do you do? Cross your legs and just hope some girl's going to fall in your lap? Definitely not. No, you got to go hunting, <laughs> yep. right? So Usually with, crawling. Without, yeah. yeah. 
without a long <laughs> drawn out explanation, but you can actually look and you will see that there are emotional functions and psychological functions connected to each of your major organs that drive the musculoskeletal skeletal system to feed those needs is what I'm saying. Yeah. So I immediately realized at that point after in studying lots of research that backed this up and even people would say, well, where'd you learn all that? I said, well, um, how about um, Netter's Anatomy? I can show you right in Netter's Anatomy. I can show you the exact anatomy, proving exactly what I'm talking right in a standard anatomy text. But it was amazing to me. All these people just completely overlooked it and pretend it wasn't even there. I'm like, what they teach you in school? I would look through this anatomy book and ask him one question. How do the organs relate to the muscles? And I found it in 28 minutes. Um, so what happened was, as I said, okay, I know now that I have got to look in every medical case for any indication of hormonal imbalance, which is glands, things like inability to produce hydrochloric acid, which causes all sorts of problems with the stomach and parasite infections and fungal infections, dot, dot, dot. I've got to, and, and, and whatever I found, whenever I had someone with chronic musculoskeletal problems, 98% of the time I found gland and organ dysfunctions connected to it and they couldn't heal because they didn't have a good enough diet, they didn't have the right nutrition, they didn't have enough sleep or rest, they were either over-exercising over or under-exercising. Do you see what I'm showing you? I could show why that person wasn't healing, and when I corrected the things to allow the organs to have the nutrients and the rest they needed, all of a sudden, spine started to stabilize, pain started to go away, trigger points would clear up magically. So... One thing led to another, and I said, okay, well, what would control organs then? So if you look at the map, well, what controls organs is the upper cervical spine. Why? Because the spinal cord goes right through the atlas. Every single nerve in your body passes through the foramen magnum into the spinal cord through the atlas, and the atlas, by the way, turns out to be, there's only two places where you have significant ligamentous connections from the spinal cord to the spinal vertebra. The denticulate ligaments attach to the atlas and sometimes to C2 and the phylum terminale, the tail of the nervous system, connects to the coccyx. So if you have an atlas problem, and then I did tons of research and read piles and piles of studies by the National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association, I literally read every one of their scientific mono their journals, monographs, for, since they started writing them, hundreds of them, like since 1980-something, and found piles of evidence. Then, then I studied the medical literature, then I studied anatomy, and lo and behold, I found a mountain of evidence showing if the atlas is out of place more than three-quarters of one degree, the denticulant ligaments will put torque through the dura and will disrupt the axonal connections, and the synaptic gaps either get stretched too much, which inhibits neural activity, or they get compressed, and slight compression causes neural excitation. So all of a sudden, I was finding that people, for example, that had chronic constipation would get their atlas corrected and instantly start pooping. Right. I've seen many cases of women that had not had a period for six months, a year, two, three years, get their atlas correction, and within 10 minutes would start menstruating because the spinal cord was being compressed or put under traction. So then I said, okay, what happens if the sacrum's out of place? Well, it puts adverse mechanical tension on the spinal cord and can do the same damn thing. So what I'm showing you here is I found, okay, well, if the atlas is out of place, it will override those organs because it'll disrupt the communication between the brain and the organ, and the system cannot regulate itself. It can't compensate effectively. So if you take the same scenario I was just talking about, say the uterus being pro a problem, but the person comes to you with chronic low back pain that won't go away, and then you try to do all the things you need to do to help the uterus heal, and it's not working, if there's an atlas subluxation, it could be stopping the body from responding because even though the brain has the the body has the resources, the brain cannot regulate the control mechanisms because the communication system is broken. Mm -hmm. It's out of balance. It's being yeah. torqued, right? So then I thought, okay, well, geez, we always have to clear that. So I studied upper cervical pathology. I took courses, advanced physical therapy courses. I I made a deal with all the physical therapists that I worked with for four years because they kept wanting me to teach them stuff. But when I would ever ask them to teach me stuff like Atlas stuff or whatever, oh, you can't do that. You don't have a license. You're not allowed to touch the spine. I get all this professional nose up horseshit. I said, okay, I got a, a new rule for you. 
I won't teach you anything unless you teach me something I want to know. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to share with me, I will not share with you. And some of them were so up themselves, they would never ask me any questions. But fortunately for me, the best physical therapist, I found the best therapist and the best doctors are the most open-minded and play the, don't play the silly games. I've had the, some of the best doctors in the world happy to sit down and swap information with me all day when teach me anything I wanted to know because they knew I was smart enough not to abuse it, right? Yeah. So, so then what I found out, and I would keep studying the research and say, okay, well, what could cause an atlas subluxation or what would be more important than an atlas subluxation that if you didn't address it, either would keep you in a state of subluxation, keep triggering the subluxation, or would cause the body to compensate in such a way that it set you up for subluxation because you have a distorted posture or a, like a lateral scoliosis, for example. Well, I went and found any time there's a problem with the vestibular system, you, you have to clear that first or none of these things will respond. And then I found out in many cases, I would test people's hearing and find that they were tone deaf in one ear. So th take a, a banker. Yeah. He sits there talking about loans all day with people trying to sell loans and he can't hear out of his right ear. So he turns his head to the left, doesn't even know he's doing it, but he's got his head turned 14, 15 mm -hmm. degrees to the right all day to get his left ear closer to the person. So this yeah. person's got chronic neck problems. And if you're constantly turning your neck and then your neck adapts to that position, now your back is torqued because the neck controls the back. The neck's a, a huge influence over the back. So you see what's happening uh, here. Yeah. So I thought, well, you got to clear the vestibular system and you got to clear hearing. And I found piles of people with hearing problems that they didn't even know they were having that were causing these kinds of problems. So I said, well, what, what would be more important than that? So I studied the research. I studied the neural pathways. I studied mountains of, of papers. And I found that the eyes actually are more influential on the system than the vestibular system and the ears are. 80% of your proprioception in space comes from your eyes. And then I found research all the way back from like the 1930s and 40s, and actually as far back as 1925. Uh, uh, one of the authors is Lomax. I can't remember the other one right now. But they actually found an orthopedic surgeon. I found research, and the orthopedic surgeon was running into the same kinds of problem that I ha was having. Back patients that weren't responding, and he made friends with an ophthalmologist. And the ophthalmologist said, well, I've found that when I correct people's eyes, a lot of their back problem goes away. And he said, really? So they started doing research mm. together. And this paper showed the correlation of their research. And they found that one out of every three chronic back pain patients had an ocular dysfunction. Oh. They either had a visual dysfunction or an imbalance in their eye muscles. And the eye muscles control the entire musculoskeletal system. All you got to do is hook someone up to a 32-channel EMG. You can bolt their head still if you want to in their whole body. Whatever direction you look, that whole EMG fires up. If you look up, all the extensors turn on. If you look down, all the flexors wow. turn on. You look left, every muscle that rotates you to the left turns on. It pre-facilitates the whole motor system. So if you've got an imbalance in your eyes, it will induce a musculoskeletal imbalance, and it will throw the whole system off. And the, For example, if you've got an exophoria in your left eye, which means the eye is the lateral recti is too tight, it'll pull your eye to the left, your whole body will twist yeah. to try to get the eyes into binocular vision because if you can't maintain binocular vision, and here's <laughs> another thing, the, the eye muscles are striated skeletal muscles. So they're susceptible to fatigue just like any muscle that when you exercise. So if your eyes don't rest in parallel binocular vision, they become exhausted and people get terrible trigger points in their eyes, which refer pain right into their brain and shut down circulatory systems in the brain and cause n reflex changes in the autonomic system that shut internal systems down. I've known of two cases where someone treating trigger points in the eyes and a blind person had complete restoration of sight because the trigger points were referring pain into the visual centers, causing so much vasoconstriction, it shut down the visual centers in the brain. I've seen wild stuff happen under my own hands in clinical practice because I knew where to look and how to look. So what you find out is everyone that sees me gets an eye exam. You can see the eye chart right at the end of the hall. Yep. I studied neuromuscular therapy. I learned to treat the muscles of the eyes with trigger point therapy using special techniques. I studied pelvic floor therapy. I know how to intra do intrapelvic work. I'm trained in that. I had doctors who kept 
trying to do trigger point injections and couldn't hit the trigger points because their palpation skills were so, so 13 jo do doctors signed a letter petitioning the state of California to let me go to physician's assistant school to get licensed to give medical injection without having any kind of university degree or anything. And it turns out it's legal in the state of California. So I went to physician's assistant school and got trained in medical injection and would do all the trigger point injections for doctors. So I learned all sorts of stuff about that. Then I studied dry needling with C. Chan Gunn, a famous medical doctor from San Diego, and found out you could do a better job with an acupuncture needle than a hypodermic needle because hypodermic needles cut and damage the tissue. So you mm -hmm. create an injury trying to fix something. So what happened was is, is then I said, okay, well, what, what might have more power than the eyes? And lo and behold, I found the research showing that every time you have malocclusion, your body will change the position of your head to try to get your teeth to fit together because if your teeth don't fit together, you open and close your mouth on average 4,000 times a day. So I have a question for you. If your teeth don't fit together and you keep opening and closing and every time you swallow, your teeth engage and you eat and you talk, how long do you have before you wear your teeth out? Oh, are you talking about a couple of yeah. years? You got a couple of years, mm -hmm. and you can watch the teeth shrinking. I've seen a thousand cases of it. Mm -hmm. They lose vertical dimension. When you lose vertical dimension in your teeth, then your temporomandibular joint sinks up into the temporal bone and compresses the neurovascular supply to the temporal mandibular joint. And now you get degenerative changes in the joint. You get tremendous pain. And then I found studies by Irvin M. Kaur, the collected papers of Irvin M. Kaur, who was hired by the American Osteopathic Association to do years of research to try to prove physiologically how chiropractic and osteopathic manipulation worked. And his research was mind-boggling, and he showed you can put a one-millimeter shim between people's teeth anywhere in the jaw, anywhere in the bite, any tooth, and it will cause the musculoskeletal system to go crazy. And he had multi-channel EMG research showing this. Any Now, so I have a question for you. Have you ever got a sesame seed stuck in your tooth before? Yes. And yeah. what does your tongue do trying to get that son of a bitch out oh, of there? It won't crazy. stop. It won't stop. <laughs> you will crazy. injure yeah. yourself. Yeah, the, t to the yeah. tongue will get raw just trying to yes. get it out. Yeah. Why? Because your jaw has to fit together. And your jaw muscles are wired to your upper cervical spine in your eyes. You have an oculocervical pathway. So if anything affects the eyes, it affects the neck and the jaw. If anything affects the jaw, it affects the eyes and the neck. And the eyes, neck, jaw, and vestibular system are all wired together, and they control everything below your head. Boom. Oh. <laughs> so so that literally is like a survival instinct when your tongue's going crazy because your jaw's not fitting correctly and it goes it's, it's it, it there's no way to turn your tongue off because your body recognizes it's a there's threat. huge problems a coming your threat. way and your tongue is actually an internal organ yeah, your tongue's really it's important. It's innervated by the glossopharyngeal <laughs> nerve. It's super important. And there's some, like, balance. My wife says yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's super important. So, yeah. so Probably the second most important thing I've so, got going on. So then I said, okay, who's the best at jaw stuff? So I found Mariana Roccobato, who's a professor of physical therapy and has a PhD in dentistry at the University of Santiago, Chile. And he comes to the United States, and this is a long time ago. So I studied every one of his courses. I did his TMJ training and his advanced TMJ training three times because it's very complicated, but I mastered it, right? So then I said, okay, now I've got to not only check everybody's sacrum, I've got to check their emotional system. We didn't get into that one yet. I've got to check their glands and organs. I've got to check their upper cervical spine. I've got to check auditory vestibular. I've got to check eyes. I've got to check teeth. And I said, holy shit, every single person I found that was failing in the medical system that was an athlete with chronic problems, I found not only one or two, but I often found 25 problems in here, right? And I learned by studying and training intensively all over the world how to address a lot of these things, how to do manual therapy, how to do muscle energy techniques, how to do mobilization techniques, how to do soft tissue therapy, how to do trigger point release, how to release the fascia, how to normalize the system. There's a lot of training involved. Yeah. Now, you know why it takes seven years to finish your training as a Czech professional. It's deep stuff. And I have medical doctors in there, podiatrists. It's a, people from all over the world in every profession come to take my <coughs> training because they don't learn this stuff in school. Nowhere. Okay? So then, to, to make a long story short, I said, okay, well, what's even more powerful than the jaw? Breathing. Mm. 
That's oh yeah. <laughs> and I looked at the research. Of, <laughs> of so I have learned. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and I looked at the research of Major Bertrand de Jarnet, a famous chiropractor who, back in the 1920s, got very rich because he invented one of the first systems for processing film. He was a chiropractor, but he was a genius, and he figured out how to process film, sold his ideas to Kodak, made millions of dollars, and so he was getting such great results with chiropractic, but he couldn't figure out how some of these results were happening. So he hired somebody to do research for him, and most doctors, I've never met a single doctor that realizes this, but guess what the name of the man he hired to do research for him to figure all this stuff out? And when I tell you, I bet you'll know if you've done any, done any research on the human body, Arthur C. Guyton, the author of Guyton's textbook of physiology, which is used in almost every medical school, physical therapy school, chiropractic school, anywhere in the world because it's the definitive text on human physiology. And what medical doctors who hate chiropractors don't know is that their whole research, the whole book was largely funded by a chiropractor's research <laughs> and Guyton <laughs> learned all that stuff working for a chiropractor. <laughs> I love how hilarious you think that is. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. It's hilarious, right? <laughs> so the Guyton textbook of physiology was largely funded by a chiropractor who was so fascinated that he could get these results but couldn't figure out how. Yeah. So just like the American Osteopathic Association hired... Um, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Irvin M. Kaur, who's an amazing man. I don't know if he's alive anymore, but I've been to lectures with him. When this guy was 85, 88 years old, he was sharp as a tack, funny, a genius of a man. I mean, I love Irvin M. Kaur. And his research, if you read it today, if you just get the collected papers of Irvin M. Kaur, which was done in the late, late 40s and early 50s, it's rocket science even today. And most people don't even know about it. And I'm like, you guys got all these fancy fucking degrees. You don't even know what the real research is. You don't know where all this stuff came from. You haven't looked at the good stuff. You're getting all this fluffy shit. You know? <laughs> I think I've got a couple decades to of reading to do I, yeah. just well, standing it, here minimum. it's taken me you can pay <laughs> rent over well, there in, in the library I've been doing this for, <laughs> I've been doing this for 32 years and, the, and, and my wife can guarantee you the studying has been intensive because there's a fucking lot to know this is what I tell people look you got personal trainers in the gym that can get their goddamn personal training certification out of a bubblegum machine past 75 multiple question tests on the internet I say look physical therapists play with pink dumbbells and stretch cords yeah but you got people with their body weight to two to three times body weight on their back, and you're torturing them. And did you realize 72% of people have an undiagnosed disc bulge ready to blow at any time, and they don't even know it? And that's people that have never had an incidence of low back pain. That's solid scientific research using MRI studies. People in gyms are booby traps that are eating crap food, taking drugs, not sleeping, unhappy, and you're getting the shit beat out of them in CrossFit and all this other stuff. And when a guy like me walks in the gym, I can look at any one of you and in about three seconds tell you more than your mother knows about you. And I'm watching these people just get the shit beat out of them. And yeah. they end up in doctor's offices. I can. And I don't have nothing against CrossFit. I just think it's dangerous for people that aren't prepared for it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong. For any, any sport. But like yeah, yeah. It's any sport. It's yeah. kettlebells. Yeah. It's fun, medicine balls. All of it. Right. That's why the check system's designed to teach you how to assess people and how to build them up progressively, <laughs> safely, and intelligently. Yeah. Check Level 3 is a nine-day course where you learn how to assess all this stuff, and it's the most intense course, and it takes tremendous study to get ready for it. And I've had physical therapists and chiropractors break down emotionally and walk out of my classes because they said, I can't handle this. It's too much for me. This is I never even dreamed that there was personal trainers, let alone a guy with a ninth grade education that could take me this deep, and they're just not ready to study that hard anymore. This is because I test you on this. Is, you don't, there's no faking it and guessing at multiple choice questions. You either know what you're doing or you don't. There's no in-between for, for, for me, right? Because I work with very expensive athletes and people that I cannot fuck around with, Yeah. right? So the point is, you get up to the breathing center, so you study respiratory. I've got entire volumes on respiratory physiology. 
I found breathing problems out the yazoo. As a matter of fact, it's the most common thing I see. I have not met a single professional athlete. I won't name names, but some of the biggest names in many sports have been in my hands, and I haven't met one of them that knew how to breathe properly. And the breathing mechanism is so susceptible to emotional sources of disruption. So we didn't even go down there yet, but the, the limbic emotional system is where you see the face frowning and the heart and the gut and the colon, I talked to you guys about that earlier before the interview, and that's related to our emotions and its effects on our physiology and our organs and our structure, right? So the, the, the emotional system floats because it, it, it can overpower every system in the body, including yeah. breathing. And if you're, if you're emotional about anything, happy or sad, it affects your breathing instantly. Mm-hmm. And my, the reason I was talking about D. Jarnett, by the way, is because Dejarnet showed beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, w- without a technical explanation, just know that every time you inhale and exhale, when you inhale, all your spinal curves reduce, which makes your spine longer. Mm-hmm. You're aware of that, right? All you got to do is lean against a wall and take a deep breath, and your head will slide up the wall. You'll get longer. This is part of the cerebral spinal pump system. So as you inhale, your sp- the distance between your coccyx and the base of your skull lengthens, so the lumen of your spinal cord, which is full of cerebral spinal fluid, gets smaller, which pushes it back up into the ventricles of the brain. Mm-hmm. Then when you exhale, your curves increase, which then allows the fluid come out of the ventricles of the brain back down to the spinal cord. It takes something like 12 hours for your cerebral yep. spinal fluid to circulate one time through your body. And every single part of your body goes through supination when you inhale, an opening, so you have abduction, external rotation, and extension when you inhale, and even your cranial sutures move, right? And the medical system's been telling us those cranial sutures didn't move. The osteopaths proved that they moved. Core showed that they moved in the 40s. And there's still doctors that tell you that you're a nut if you think those things move. I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me. All you got to do is smoke some good indica, relax, and put your hands on somebody's head for about five minutes, and you'll feel the damn things moving. And if you can't feel it, you shouldn't be a therapist. you got ten thumbs. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay? Well, I, I've got so, one question is... Um, I, I've studied a little bit of breath work and with the spinal fluid, yep. uh, what I've been told with certain practices, you can actually speed that up beyond 12 hours and process things more quickly and clean things up. You probably could. Um, tai Chi, Qigong. Uh, on a side note, one of the things that's been shown to clean up the cerebral spinal fluid is chanting, toning, or singing mm. because the resonance in the, the, in the nasal cavities and the throat cavities causes a vibration that actually has a cleansing effect on the cerebral spinal fluid. And right. Wyoming you're, is you're not all wrong. I had that right word. <laughs> yeah. And, and so oh. the, the Tibetan monks were way ahead right. of us. I could tell you all sorts of stuff about my studies of, of ancient shaman and Tibetan monks and the stuff they knew. That'd be a whole other podcast, but it's <laughs> mind-boggling. Oh, we think our doctors are smart. It's a joke. The, the, we only figured out that acupuncture worked uh, in the 70s, and we only figured out that the human energy field was real when we could capture on Kirlian photography, but the monks were mapping this stuff out. The Tibetan monks, for example, showed that the energy field of the body, including the meridians, shows up at within minutes of gestation. And the whole mm. body is following the electromagnetic map that's created by the soul moving into the body and activating the polarities of male and female when the sperm and the egg meet. They figured this out because they were clairvoyant. They used to sit in caves and meditate, and they could see energy. But medical people didn't even believe that until they started filming it with Curlian photography. They figured that out 900 years ago. Hmm. I got books in my office right here documenting the whole thing. I haven't finished my point, though. <laughs> D. Jarnett <laughs> D. Uh, D. showed that if a disruption in the musculoskeletal system stops the normal um, cerebral spinal pump mechanism or disrupts the ability for the sacrum to go through what's called nutation and counter nutation nutation is flexion counter nutation is extension so when you uh, when you inhale you reduce your curves your sacrum goes into counter nutation when you exhale it goes into nutation these are osteopathic terms the point is Dvarnet showed that is a critical survival system 
and the body will sacrifice any system to compensate, and he showed that the first thing that'll happen if the body can't do it is people start leaning forward and backward, and you can actually put them on bilateral scales and watch their weight shifting. So I started measuring it and tracking it. I found if you have a left to right weight shift or an anterior to posterior weight shift of more than five pounds, you've got a significant problem going on. So all my practitioners are trained how to measure and assess this stuff. I'm getting terrified. I'm like, how many fucking things are wrong with me? <laughs> well, the thing is, is your, your body's a master compensator. Remember, we're designed to function without doctors. So the thing is, comp compensation is stress, though. Right. Compensation is not the problem. It's when you go into decompensation, when you run out of energy to compensate. That's mm -hmm. when you get things broken. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to finish my point, G. Jarnett showed first people start leaning forward and backward. Okay. Watch this. You guys are intelligent people. I'll give you a tip. The average person breathes 25,900 times a day. Oh, by the way, that's exactly how many years it takes for our planet and our, planet and our sun to make one lap of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. Steiner showed us that. Mm -hmm. Your breathing cycle's tied into astronomical cycles. You are the fucking universe breathing, talking, and hanging out with Paul today. Okay? <laughs> yes. So <laughs> what he showed is, is this, that a person starts flexing like this to pump because when you bend forward like that, yeah. it stretches the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a question for you. You know what the nucleus of a disc is, don't you? What happens if you bend forward 25,900 pounds a day but don't go back into extension? You're just going to get stuck there. No, you're going to pump the nucleus backwards until it oh. herniates. Mm -hmm. Until it herniates. Okay. Now, you do research on what percentage of people have breathing pattern disorders. It's about 90 to 95%. And then you see why you have all these herniated discs popping up out of nowhere. And people that 85% of all orthopedic injuries are idiopathic. That means there's no knowledge of an event that caused the problem. So then Dijarnet showed that if the body gets fatigued and can't compensate in the sagittal plane, it starts leaning to the side. Well, guess what happens? The posterior lateral aspects of the lumbar disc are the weakest areas of the disc. So you get posterior lateral disc herniation, which is the most common, right? So once a person goes into stage two, or uh, I think it's stage three in his system, compensation, they usually end up with a posterior lateral disc bulge because the system breaks down. It can't take it anymore. Yeah. And they're grounded. They're, they're in deep shit. Mm -hmm. Okay? So now, to, to finish, just to, to, if I can just finish sure, my thought. So I said, okay, well, I got something missing in my totem pole because even though I had done a lot of work and figured all this out and I was quite impressed with myself, my little ego was petting itself. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> honestly, a lot of the greatest doctors I've ever met in my life look at the system and started using it and it blew their minds. In fact, one of my students is the head of physiatry at the Mayo Clinic and he was taking this stuff back to the Mayo Clinic and teaching the physical therapist and was blowing their freaking mind because it works. One of my students is a physiotherapist and a chiropractor and as part of his, um, Kieran McPhail, as part of his school uh, work to um, write a thesis and do his research, he wanted to see if he could scientifically validate the totem pole. He found 149 scientific papers that backed up my totem pole. 149 of them. I have them all. Wow. Okay. But there was a lot of people I could correct all this stuff, except some of these things would not keep, would not hold. Like I could teach a person how to breathe right. And I have what's called the parking lot test. If you can walk out to a, in my clinic, in my rule, if you're, you don't know you've done a good shield, a lot of therapists think just because your pelvis is straightened on the table that you're fixed. So I used to say to the therapist, that's bullshit. You got to do the parking lot test. What's that? Have your patient walk out of the building, touch their car and come back and retest them. If it still holds, you did something. Because mm -hmm. if you've got a higher order control system, the instant you start walking, it'll manipulate to go into compensation to serve a higher order system. You yeah. follow me? Mm -hmm. So most people don't pass the parking lot test. So I was finding that my patients often failed my own parking lot test, which was frustrating because I'm like, oh my God, I am missing something. And I've covered a lot of something. Now, by this time, I've studied a lot and I've seen thousands of people and I'm, you know, I'm, I got some firing going on up here. So I'm like, there's something missing. So one of the first things I started realizing is that when I was looking into the emotional aspects of people's lives and their relationships and their diet, I found 
issues that were driving the respiratory system because they were holding on to emotions, which tightens up the abdominal wall, which disrupts the entire breathing apparatus, turns them into chest breathers, overworks the scalenes, causes chronic neck problems, and a long, long list of things. So what I found out also, by the way, um, and this is a later thing I learned, anytime you eat processed sugar, it acidifies your body so quick that in order to protect the pH of the blood, which has to stay right at about 7.35, your body begins to hyperventilate because oxygen alkalinizes the blood. So processed sugar is such a powerful acid, it leads to hyperventilation in people, and you can never normalize their blood gas ratios, which leads to anxiety, ADD behavior, because it keeps them sympathetically charged all the time. So I found I couldn't correct the breathing pattern in anyone eating processed sugar, and it's in almost every damn thing. It's in meats, it's in bacon, they stick that shit everywhere. Why? Because it's highly addictive. It's hard to eat at a restaurant. Because they, in order to make it taste good, they, they put added something to it. It's everything. You go to a supermarket yeah. and look at every label, and you'd be blessed if you can find something that does not have processed sugar hidden in it. Mm -hmm. And they use all sorts of things like uh, dextrose or maltose. They hide it all sorts yeah. of ways. But it's processed sugar, and it screws up the pH balance of the body, which triggers hyperventilation processes. So, you know, what I'm trying to show you here is that the mental emotional factors drive the breathing and the breathing drives the body and the mental emotional mental emotional factors all behaviors are the product of beliefs conscious or unconscious mm -hmm. so after all my years to finish this thing i realized i had to look deeply into person a person's mental emotional life their relationships that you could not avoid diet, not only for the dietary and nutritious reasons, but for balancing pH in the body and regulating the breathing apparatus. So that took me into a deep study of depth psychology, relationship, uh, everything I needed to, to learn about relationships, relationship counseling, uh, it look, it look into, in issues of self-esteem, self-motivation. I studied adult attachment and infant detachment disorders, childhood development, parenting influences. And it's a long story, but it took me years and years of research to now or have a very comprehensive system and not a lot slips through the net. Hmm. That's so not, it's not perfect because the body is really complicated. But it takes about seven years for my students to master that. And it took me 32 years to figure it all out, and you know, including because I'm still practicing and learning. I had the totem pole up to the breathing figured out by about maybe 99, 2000. And then I added the psyche on maybe in 2006 because there was just people that I couldn't get to normalize unless I went into their mental, emotional life and their relationships and... And then that led right to religious programming almost every time, oh. right? Remember, all behaviors are the result of beliefs. If you track beliefs back, you'll be surprised to find that you almost always get to something that's a belief about what God wants or demands of you as a commandment or I sh thou shalt not. And I found religious programming at the root of massive numbers of chronic musculoskeletal organ and gland and hormonal disorders. Yeah. So I studied world religion. I took numerous courses on it, university courses on it, to learn how these people think. And then I developed the skills to help. And I studied consciousness. I studied Ken Wilber's work for years. So I developed a system of showing them where their religion's at. And most people don't even understand their religions. I've never met a single Christian that knew what the word Adam meant, what the word Eve meant, or what the word Christ actually means. Most people think, for example, Jesus Christ is a name. The word Christ is a title. It means that you are one with the universe. It means you've achieved universal consciousness, that you are now one with the universe. So as I say to the Christians, if you know what the word Christ means, I have a question for you. If you're one with the universe, how do you come back? They're all waiting for the second coming of Christ. I say, Jesus Christ is someone whose consciousness unified itself with the entire universe, so he's here all the time. All you've got to do is act like Christ. Be Christ-like. And then you don't need Jesus to come back. All this warring and fighting is because you're not acting like Christ. You're not practicing Christianity. Christianity is one of the most radical religions there is if you get to the core tenets of it. 
but people are practicing corporate Christianity because it keeps them profitable, profitable to the Vatican, prof- profitable to the medical system, profitable to all sorts of systems. I mean, and the list is so bloody long, and it's not just Christianity. It's Islam, it's Judaism, and Buddhism has its own problems. Less, though. I studied this extensively. So I had to study the, the science on how consciousness grows and develops to actually then say, okay, here's where a person's at in their religious beliefs. How do I take them up one step? Because if I take them too far, it blows the wheels off. Now, you know, what do you do? You go home and tell your mom and dad you're not going to church anymore? That's going to be a lot more stress than your breathing system can handle. (laughs) (laughs) And it ruins your relationship. So I had to spend years and years of studying and working with patients to learn how to take them up one step at a time And I learned that most people do not, I would say 98% of people actually don't understand their own religion. So I studied these religions. I got dictionaries for all the religions from all over the world, studied what the words meant, and I sit them down and show them if you just practice what your religion actually means, most of the stuff goes away. Because what you're practicing is what was programmed into your head like a little child. And you've never actually questioned the authority figures. And so I'm going to give you a quote that you should always remember. And it's by a very wise man named Shankara, who was a philosopher sage, a Hindu philosopher sage, who at eight years of age was walking all over India looking for the greatest gurus to debate. And he rarely ever lost a debate at eight and ten years of age. Shankara said, no man can understand scripture until he is enlightened, which means Christed. And when he is enlightened, he does not need scripture. Okay, so here's the question I have for you. How many people teaching in Sunday schools and churches all over the world and temples are enlightened? Almost none. So what are you getting? Poor interpretations from underdeveloped people that should not be teachers. It would be like having fat, sick people teaching exercise in a gym, which we often do. So what I found in my journey is that to be a skilled therapist requires a tremendous amount of study And it requires a tremendous amount of development because you cannot take a patient or a client or an athlete any further than you've taken yourself. If you hire someone to take you up a mountain, but they've only climbed halfway up the mountain, the instant you cross the halfway line, you're now paying someone to get lost with you. You don't have a guide anymore. So Czech professionals are taught and tasked to apply all these teachings to themselves and to be authentic leaders in the community and to grow themselves and to be authentic and not bullshit people and know when they're in above their head to ask for help so that they don't mislead people and take money from them when they're lost. And that's my life mission. That's what I'm here to do. And that's why you're standing in the room with me. Because if I hadn't done it, you wouldn't be here. That's my final comment. I think we got oh my God. There. Yeah, thank you for... Yeah, I don't think anyone does anyone have anything to say because <laughs> I'm like this. That, is, that was a fantastic show. Thank you, yeah. thank, thank you, you for uh, having us to your office, thanks. and thanks for the tour, and thanks for just sharing authentically and vulnerably. This has been uh, really amazing. It's my pleasure. You know, I, I I applaud you guys for sharing too because look, if people like us don't work together to help other people find healthier more honest, more authentic ways of doing everything from lifting weights to eating to living to sleeping. You, you don't need to be a genius to, to do the math. We're heading for big trouble. The earth is dying. We're running out of resources. We have a lot of major problems that are far bigger than uh, how much can I lift tomorrow. But the reality of it is if I can motivate an athlete to eat organic food and to drink quality water and to spend money on the companies that are making products that are produced by corporations that are earth friendly. The rule is this, humanity itself is like an organism and each human being is like a cell in that organism just like your body's made of 100 trillion cells. So cancer starts with one cell and grows to be a problem that kills you and if we wanna make a change in the world, the one thing we can do to make sure we do that is to take care of ourselves better, love ourselves better, grow, heal, and be a good example for others, and spend our money where it supports the earth and other people. 
and then you know you can leave the planet knowing you did something to make the world a better place each day. So you don't have to run out and rescue people and tell the uh, Bible thumpers to put their Bible down and, st and <laughs> go study with a yogi or whatever. All we got to do is teach people to eat better, live better, love better, and take care of themselves. And the research shows that we grow consciously. We are, there's something inside of a human being that wants growth. As long as we feed people and, and show them how to keep their bodies healthy, then the spirit of the human being keeps reaching because it always wants to find out what it is. And what it is is something greater than we can put on paper because the instant you try to describe the source of what we all are, you're already wrong mm -hmm. because that thing is everything. And to describe something means to dissect it. So the problem is with all this talk about God, the instant you start talking about it, you're already wrong. And that's why whenever anyone asked Buddha to describe God, he just went silent. And they thought he was just playing tricks on him or didn't want to tell him. But he was making the point. You cannot talk about what we are. You can't talk about what the source of the universe is. But you can love each other. And the more you love yourself and the more you love others, the more you're godding. Yeah. And to understand how life works and how the body works is to keep yourself healthy enough to naturally follow the growth of consciousness, which means to become a more loving, more intelligent, more capable human being. And so my point is, it's because of guys like you that we can share these kinds of things. So now all the athletes training becomes much more meaningful because mm -hmm. now it's not just about dick swinging. Yeah. It's about supporting each other yeah. and it's about making ethical, honest, and moral decisions, a moral is a code of conduct that is life affirmative. An ethic is a code of conduct that may or may not be life affirmative. When I was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division, I had a great big manual about who to kill and who not to kill. That's an ethics manual. But morality is about making decisions that are life affirmative, which means supporting all of us and we need each other, right? We all need, we're all here together. We're all cells in that same organism. So if one athlete learns to eat better, live better and love better, and embraces the kind of things we're talking about, we've already made an honest change in the world. So thank you guys for giving people like me a chance to share because we, we need all hands on deck right now. Yes, sir. Where can people find more of, if they want to go to the Czech Institute, what do they do? Uh, www.chekinstitute. Um, my personal blog is www paul c h e k s b l o g dot com paul checks blog dot com and my youtube channel where i have over 500 videos you can watch for free on all sorts of stuff i mean from everything we've been talking about and more is youtube dot com forward slash paul c h e k live youtube dot com forward slash paul check live over 500 videos some of them quite deep too oh thank you anders I just We're want to say fun. thank you. Oh, thank yeah. you. I am very much on this uh, path. I got rid of my, well, I say get rid of, uh, sold my gym and got into this rehabilitation world, finding breathing and this entire journey that you were talking about. Um, one of the goals of my life is to be in rooms with people like you, thank you. and you guys. And this has been just like such an awesome experience to thank you. see your office and experience kind of your journey. Thank you. Um, know that I'm kind of on this same path and yeah. uh, to see somebody that's been there is just really incredible so thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm with you on it every day and I'll just say before we go uh, remember the books that are most suitable for the public are my book How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy which is unique. Because Love that book by the way. Yeah, yeah. It's the only book that I've ever seen that sh gives you an, an assessment that you can fill out a questionnaire shows you exactly what specific challenge you have in your body and you can follow the book and it'll give you the specific information you need. You can follow the exercise programs and they're based on how much stress you are. So it's the only one of the only books I've ever seen in the world that individualizes your unique program for your needs, which I did because we're all as different on the inside as we are on the outside. So I wanted to develop something that wasn't a, a cookie cutter because that doesn't work. And then my, my little ebook the last four doctors you'll ever need how to get healthy now, both of which are available at thecheckinstitute.com. Uh, Eat, Move, and Be Healthy is on Amazon. We've now sold 160,000 copies of it, so it's doing pretty good. Excellent. Yeah. Very cool. Thanks, guys. Um, but yeah, if you want to come and find me, movement-rx.com. We are combining strength and conditioning and physical therapy into programs that are accessible by gym owners 
members, um, anyone suffering from shoulder, low back, knee pain, incorporating breath balance, behavior patterns that lead you to a healthier life. Uh, if you want to find me on the socials, it's Anders Varner, but Movement Rx, movement-rx.com. Cool. Right on. Uh, you can find me at Douglas E. Larson on Instagram. Uh, also got a cool side project coming up, uh, DougLarsonFitness.com. That's where it, kind of like my catch-all site where I'm going to be putting you know, my thoughts on, on all things fitness uh, as well as if, I'm, if I have seminars coming up, which right now I do have some seminars coming up over the summer. So uh, if you're interested in that, go to DougLarsonFitness.com and uh, have all kinds of cool stuff there to check out. Oh, and you can find me at TheBloodsoShow.com. A lot more podcasts happening over there, and I have some events and seminars coming up. You can find it on that website. Thanks for joining us, and make sure to go over to iTunes. Give us a five-star review, positive comment, and I'll see you next week. And as I say, if you like the uh, – this is what I say to my students. If you like the, the seminar or the workshop, tell everybody. If you didn't, it's our secret. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the show. If you liked the show, which I know you did, please go share it on Facebook, Instagram, or whatever social media channel you happen to be loving at the moment. Pinterest? Twitter? Tumblr. Tumblr. Share it on Tumblr. Sure. Next up, Barbell Strike, we talked to Shane Farmer from Dark Horse Rowing. Talking about coaching, rowing, mechanics, and what you're probably fucking up. <laughs> <laughs>